Vengeance, Another Generation, Academy of Ancients, Book 11, written by Avery Cross, narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Chapter 1. Meg. Cody and I were on borrowed time. Every morning that I awakened and he was still at Academy of Ancients, that was all I could think of. Our time together wasn't going to last. It couldn't. The wraiths attacking campus had been too massive of a story to conceal for long. At some point, my parents would figure out that Cody and I were involved with the wraiths. How much they'd find out, I had no idea. As far as I could tell, no one had paid much attention to me during the fight. Only those who'd known that I could summon the five elements had noticed me turn into a magical booster. But eventually, my parents would figure it out. I simply couldn't decide if they'd make him leave or take me out of Academy of Ancients. Cody planted a kiss on my temple. You're doing it again. Stop spiraling. I slumped against the couch cushions. We were hanging out at Niall's apartment, which was now mine too. After my room had been destroyed by my killing the wraith, Hook had agreed to let me move in with her for the remainder of the year. We were only a couple of days away from the spring semester starting. Already students were coming back from their winter breaks. Hook had considered illusion spells to cover up the damage caused by the wraiths, but unfortunately, there'd been enough students left on campus during the break who'd already seen everything. The story of what happened had changed about twenty times now, and spread across the campus insanely fast. Most couldn't believe that someone had managed to summon wraiths. A lot of students were upset they'd missed the excitement. Thankfully, in all the versions, my name wasn't mentioned. I assumed that was thanks to Cody and the Pierce brothers somehow keeping me out of it. As far as the student population was concerned, the Talons had handled the threat and protected everyone who'd been on campus, preventing any casualties. I was more than okay with them taking the credit. Nyala was currently spending pretty much all her time in Jack and Cody's apartment. That gave Cody and me some privacy to enjoy while we could. It had been beyond nice to have him with me, not just during the day but throughout the night, too. After we'd both been attacked so viciously by the wraiths, neither of us had wanted to let the other go. That first night he was let out of the infirmary, he'd walked me up here and had hesitated at the doorway. I'd taken his hand, pulled him inside after me, and we'd fallen asleep holding each other. Cody's arm slipped around my waist, and he hauled me over onto his lap. Out with it, he grumbled, running his fingers through the hair lying loose around my shoulders. What's going on inside that head of yours? Nothing. Seriously? You've hardly said five words since we woke up this morning, and you keep giving the door a panicked look. He moved his hands over my shoulders, down my back, and finally they ended up on my hips. He sat up and gently kissed my jaw, following it to my cheek, then finally to my lips. Tell me, he whispered. I was plenty content with whiling away the morning, taking part in a leisurely makeout session, I returned his kiss instead of answering and roped my arm around his neck to draw him in closer. He moved his hands up my back and down my arms. The kiss deepened for a moment. Then he took hold of my arms and removed them from his neck. Tell me, he repeated. Party pooper. Meg. Fine, fine, I muttered. It's too quiet. What's too quiet? I haven't heard shit from my parents. I should have by now, and I can't help thinking they're plotting something bad. Cody's lips thinned, and the stones around us gave the slightest tremor. You think it has to do with me? You said you've heard nothing, right? So far. He stared at our hands, then flattened mine to his chest. He covered them with his, and it was his turn to glance beyond me to the front door. Remember what I told you? Which part? I said with a laugh. You've given me quite a few lectures these last few weeks. That we'll handle our delicate situation one day at a time. That means for right now, you should be enjoying what's left of break and not creating some insane plot created by your parents. He said it, but there was no hiding the worry that had bloomed in his eyes. I thought about telling him my plan then. It wasn't much of one, though. It was more of a decision I'd made. Somehow, once Remus was no longer coming after me, I wanted to find a way to leave my parents. I no longer wanted to be under their control. It was far past time I took my own path, and I wanted to do that with Cody by my side. 
how we'd make it work, or what I'd do if I wasn't with my parents or at Academy, I hadn't the faintest idea. Have you heard anything else about Remus? I asked. Nothing useful, but General Pierce is running point on tracking him down. My only concern right now is if the fucker decides to show back up here. The apartment trembled harder, and Cody's hold on my hands tensed. I can't stop seeing it, he whispered. That damn wraith coming straight for you. Yeah, just like I can't stop seeing you being the idiot who jumped in front of it. And I'd do it all over again, he assured me. I won't let anything happen to you. That's what scares me, I admitted. Remus went so far as to summon wraiths. Wraiths, Cody. He's still out there, and I doubt us stopping his plan was enough to make him back off. He'll come after me again. What will he use this time? How far is he willing to go, huh? I climbed off his lap and shakily walked into the small kitchen area. We'd made breakfast this morning, and there were some pancakes left on a plate. I picked one up and nibbled at it before tearing it to pieces. Cody pushed himself off the couch and came to join me. Is that what's been waking you up in the middle of the night? I shrugged. I'd been jolted awake a few times by nightmares of Cody being attacked by the wraiths. Lately, my imagination had been conjuring up different monsters to set loose on him. Each time, it was more horrifying than the last. And each time, I failed to save him while Remus cackled nearby. I thought I'd been able to hide the nightmares from Cody. I should have known better. I could hide nothing from him. I'm just worried that I won't be enough, I admitted. What do you mean? Enough to protect you. Remus and what he's doing? It's all my fault, and if you get hurt because of him, stop. He came to stand behind me, wrapping his arms around me and hugging me. How many times do I have to remind you? This isn't your fault. Remus and his family are the ones who started this, not you. He kissed my cheek, then rested his chin on my shoulder. I will not stand by while he attempts to hurt you again, and nothing you say is going to change my mind. And you need to stop seeing yourself as weak. You're far stronger than you give yourself credit for. I saw what you did out there, Meg. Yeah, and I still have no idea what I did or how I did it. I didn't even realize that was something a Villasaurus could do. I've never read about it anywhere in any of the stories I found, I mumbled, giving in and leaning into him. You haven't tried to use your magic since that day. Can you blame me? He turned me around but kept his arms on either side of me. Don't be afraid of your magic. You can control it. I've seen you do it. You've seen me control earth summoning, I pointed out. What I did out there was spirit, too. I hadn't even known I could pull on it like I did. I picked at an invisible fuzzy on his shirt, wondering if now was a good time to tell him why I was so freaked to mess with my magic again. Something else happened out there. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Yeah? Then why haven't you already told me? He countered. There was no easy way out of this conversation. Sometimes I really hate this connection we have, I mumbled. Meg, quit stalling. I heard voices, I blurted. Voices? What do you mean voices? When? During the fight? Yeah, it was weird. They all sounded like me, but not me. I stared at where my hands rested on his chest. I think it was my magic. Out there, with everything going on, I know you think I was in control, but I wasn't. Not really. Half of what I did, I didn't even think about doing. I just did it. That's just your instinct taking over. Maybe, but those voices weren't. That was the magic getting ready to break free. Or it was realizing that you were in control of it, and it was finally working with you instead of against you. He tilted my head up and sweetly kissed my lips. You have to believe in yourself at some point. You can't keep running from the gifts you were born with. Give it another day or so, but we should try to work with your magic again. We can pick up where we left off. Hell, if you asked, I have no doubt Zack and Briar would be willing to work with you on your spirit summoning, since you were able to use that too. And if you're wrong? I'm not, he said sounding so confident I couldn't help but give him a look of disbelief. He kissed me again before I could start arguing with him. He picked me up and sat me on the counter. You need a distraction. How about we see what the others are up to? I'm sure Briar and Nyala can come up with something crazy to take up the rest of the day. 
I was sure they could too. I hugged Cody and kissed him one more time, then told him to text our friends and see what they were up to. Whatever it was, it wouldn't be enough to completely overshadow the worries traipsing through my mind. A few minutes later, while Cody and I grabbed shoes and made to meet the others in the dining hall, I could have sworn I heard a clock ticking somewhere close by. Chapter 2 Cody The movie marathon we'd had last night with our friends in Zack and Briar's rooms on campus had ended well after midnight, and just as I'd hoped, hanging out with them had calmed Megan down. She'd passed out during the final horror flick, and I'd carried her to her room at Nyala's place. I'd intended to sleep in, then convince her to hit the training circle later this afternoon. Classes were starting up in a couple of days. I wanted her to try using her magic before her practical lessons began again. Last night, I'd even mentioned to Zach that if he could find a chance to work with her quietly, she'd appreciate it. He'd promised he and Briar would find the time. What I hadn't planned for today was being summoned to Headmaster Hook's office before Megan had even opened her eyes. The message had come in the form of a paper crane, hovering over my face the second I'd wakened. I'd tucked it into my pocket, jotted a quick note for Megan to find when she was up and moving around, then set out for the main building. Now, standing outside Hook's office door, I couldn't ignore the uneasiness churning in my stomach. I raised my hand and knocked. Enter! Hook's voice called out gruffly. I pushed the door open and entered the room. Headmaster Hook, I said, then sighed. General Pierce, I didn't expect to see you on campus. Do you have news about Remus? Adam Pierce stood to the side of Hook's desk, dressed in his usual Talon uniform. The headmaster was busy watering the various potted plants and shrubs he kept on the shelves around his office. Neither appeared to be in good moods. Hook kept muttering under his breath. Adam's posture was stiff, and his face was set in a scowl. I wish that was why I was here, he told me. I'm afraid I've come on behalf of Lucy and William Wright. To do what? Unfortunately, I think you know. Adam's stance relaxed, and he shook his head. They want you removed as Megan's bodyguard. They've lost faith in your ability to protect her. My heart pounded in my chest. I'm not leaving campus. You don't have a choice, Hook snapped and slammed his small watering can down on the nearest shelf. This is why I hate the council. It's why I never joined them when I had the chance. Always throwing their damn weight around, thinking they can do whatever they want. They are banishing you from Academy. How do they have that kind of authority? I asked. Adam pinched the bridge of his nose. I've been fighting them on it for the last three days. Unfortunately, after what occurred with those summoners who stalked the other students, and now wraiths being summoned to campus to cause more havoc, most of the council and several generals are backing them up. They do not believe you are sufficient protection for Megan. Rumors spread that though she wasn't involved in the fight against the wraiths, she still wound up in the infirmary after being attacked by one. A few people have gone so far as to accuse you of working with these summoners to cause her harm. Seriously? The stone floor quaked beneath my feet. Cody, please do not break my office apart, Hook said lightly, and returned to watering the remainder of his plants. I focused on reining in my magic. It took about a minute, but the room stopped shaking. Do they even realize who's after their daughter? I asked. And the council, I'm assuming none of them has the faintest idea of why Megan's being targeted, who she and her parents are. Aside from myself and Hook, and those Megan has told herself, you would be correct. The Wrights merely appear as extremely troubled parents over their daughter's safety, and though they have no grounds for these accusations of your involvement, until they're cleared up, I've been asked to remove you from campus. I dragged a hand through my hair and sank into one of the chairs in front of the desk. They don't care about the wraiths or why they were here. They only want me gone. I sat upright and cursed. Do her parents know about us being together? It's possible, though how they found out is beyond me, Adam said. I'm sorry, I wish I had better news for you today, but I'm leaving campus in an hour, and you have to be with me. They're expecting me to take you back to HQ for punishment. I scoffed, 
but Adam held up his hand, cutting off my harsh retort. Don't worry, they can think all they want that I'm going to lock you up for a couple of weeks and bind your summoning, he said with a wink. What am I going to be doing? I asked. Adam picked up a file off the desk and walked it to me. I flipped it open. Staring back at me was an old photograph of a man who had to be around my age, maybe a couple of years older. His sharp cheekbones gave him a gaunt appearance. Cold eyes stared back at me. Remus Gorgrithus, Adam said. We're going after him. I have no one better motivated to bring him in than you. It'll be an unofficial investigation, of course. There's no record of the attack on Megan from three years ago, and she's the only eyewitness to him being there while the wraiths attacked. We'll need him alive and in one piece if we want to end this. You and I both know the chances of him acting alone are slim. He wasn't wrong about me being motivated, but leaving Academy of Ancients meant not being able to keep an eye on Megan. I slammed the folder shut and stood up. And Megan? I can't leave if she's going to be without protection, more than the Talons already stationed here. She will be well looked after, trust me. Hook laughed and shook his head. So many damned troublemakers back at Academy at the same time. What could possibly go wrong? Who did you bring in? I asked. Adam grinned. My brothers, for starters. Hunter and Trish will be here as well, and a handful of others. Not to mention Zack and Briar will remain on campus. They might not be Talons, but they're damn good at protecting those they care about. As are Nyala and Jack. He rested a hand on my shoulder. Megan will be in good hands. Are the Wrights sending someone else to replace me? Someone from their personal guards? I convinced them I had it handled, so as far as I'm aware, it'll be Talons watching over her. He glanced at the clock on the wall above the office door. We can talk about the details more later. I'm sure you'd like to use your remaining time here to pack your things and say goodbye. I handed him back the file. I hadn't thought this day would come this fast. Megan's fears about her parents had been right. They had been plodding behind her back. We were lucky they were only forcing me to leave campus and not taking her away. If that happened, I had no idea how I'd get them to let me see her again without causing a massive upset with her parents. I told Adam I'd meet him out front in an hour, nodded to Hook, and left the office. Once I was outside, I jogged to the dorms and up the stairs to the apartments. When I reached Nyala's, Megan was in the kitchen, brewing a pot of coffee. Her hair was mussed from sleep, and she was bundled up in one of my gray, half-zip sweaters with only her sleep shorts underneath. I stood in the doorway, admiring the view, and committing every detail to memory. Are you going to stand there all morning? She teased. What did Hook want? I shut the door behind me, but I couldn't get myself to go to her. It was General Pierce who sent the summons, actually. She'd been reaching for the coffee pot, but stopped short. Please tell me it was because he found word on Remus. I promised I'd never lie to you. She whipped around, her eyes wide in panic. My parents sent him? I'm being banished from Academy, pending an investigation into my potential involvement with the summoners who attacked last semester and the wraiths. What? Are you serious? There's no proof, and Adam has no intention of punishing me. But your parents have riled up the entire council and a few generals. He has no choice but to remove me. But, I said, going to her and taking her hands in mine, being away from campus gives me a chance to hunt Remus down and to end the threat against you. That does nothing to make me feel better. I don't like you being out searching for him alone. I won't be. Adam is going to be with me the entire time. And I'm not leaving you alone here. You'll have plenty of eyes on you. Trust me. Her left hand twitched like she was struggling not to start tapping her fingers against her thigh. How long until you have to leave? Fifty minutes. What? I quickly pulled her into a hug, resting my chin atop her head. I know. I wish we had more time, too, but we don't. I'll text you or call you as much as I can. Swear it. You just do what you've been doing. Work on your summoning, and before you know it, I'll be back for you, Meg. I will. You'd better be. Gods, this sucks. I don't want you to go. She mumbled, her voice muffled against my chest. She squeezed me as hard as she could. Wait, she leaned backward. Do they know about us? 
I don't know. I asked that, too. Adam had no answer for me. I smoothed her hair from her face and kissed her forehead. If they do, it won't make a difference. They're not about to scare me off. Cody, I slanted my lips over hers. She kissed me back just as hard, pushing me into the kitchen counter. I wished I had longer to say goodbye. I took my time kissing her and holding her close until I knew I had to get moving. She dressed and came to my apartment with me. It took hardly any time for me to pack. With my duffel in hand, I faced Megan, standing in my empty room. If you need me for anything at all, I told her, you call me. I don't want to bother you while you're going after Remus. I snaked my arm around her waist and hauled her closer so there was no air between us. Anything, Meg. I kissed her, knowing it'd be the last time for weeks, possibly longer. You remember what I told you. You're strong. You control your power. Don't let the fear win. I'll be back as soon as I can. I swallowed hard and the next words tumbled out of my mouth before I could stop them. I love you. Then I let her go and exited the bedroom and the apartment and made my way downstairs. I hadn't said the words with any expectation of her saying them back, but if we were going to be apart for who knew how long, I needed her to know. Just in case, I thought darkly. Just in case I don't make it back to her. I was planning on returning to Academy with the news that Remus had been captured and Megan was free to live her life without a death threat hanging over her head. Whatever she chose to do after that, I'd stand by her. Adam waited for me on the main drive. We climbed into the SUV and he pulled away from Academy. We've got some more intel on Remus back at HQ, he told me while I watched campus grow smaller in the rearview mirror. We'll spend a couple of days working through it, then start tracking him down. Works for me. My cell vibrated in my pocket. I fished it out, not surprised to find a text from Megan. You better come back to me in one piece, her message said. Before I could respond, a second one appeared, and my heart stuttered. I love you, too. Chapter 3 Meg the first night without Cody was weird. In such a short time, I'd gotten used to his being beside me when I fell asleep and there when I woke up. Having him holding me close throughout the night had been comfortable and something I hadn't wanted to end. But it had. He was gone because of my parents. I held my phone in my hand while I stood in the living room of Niall's apartment. For the last 20 minutes, I'd been debating calling my parents and chewing them out. What good would that do? They hadn't called me at all over winter break. They sure as hell hadn't seemed to care that I'd been attacked by wraiths. If I called, they'd make it all my fault. And if I pushed too hard about them sending Cody away, they'd be suspicious. If they don't already know, I muttered and tossed my phone onto the couch. Damn it. That does not sound like the best way to start the spring semester, Nyala commented, exiting the short hall with a smile. How'd you sleep? I think I woke up about every hour. Nyala gave my arms a sympathetic squeeze. I'm sorry. I know this is going to be rough. Yeah, but I didn't think it'd be this rough. She bustled into the kitchen and started making a pot of coffee. I hopped up on one of the bar stools near the island and held my face in my hands while I watched her go through the mundane activity. My thoughts quickly shifted from missing Cody to those three words he'd said before he'd turned and left. It had taken me too damn long to get over the elated shock at hearing them to respond. I hoped he hadn't minded the text. From the way we'd messaged back and forth last night until I'd passed out, he hadn't. Cody loved me. I'd felt it growing between us these last few weeks. Hearing him say it, though, sent butterflies flitting around my stomach. My heart raced and my chest became tight. It was great and horrible at the same time. I wanted him here with me, but I knew why he hadn't fought to stay. He wanted Remus gone from our lives. He'd seen me hurt too many times by that asshole. Not that it did anything to alleviate my nerves. Remus had summoned wraiths to use against me. If he figured out Cody was coming after him, what would he do to him? I fiddled with a dragon charm around my neck, silently willing Cody to be careful. Nyala slid a cup of coffee toward me across the counter. I know that look. What look? 
the look that says you're about to worry yourself to pieces. Niall leaned against the counter and sipped her coffee. I saw it on Fry's face enough times, especially after Zack had to up and leave her in the middle of the night. That was rough. He did? For what? I keep forgetting you weren't around for all that crazy shit with Xylon and the necromancers. Zack was a talent for a little while. Necromancers were coming after Bry, and he took off with his brothers to hunt them down and protect her. Frost appeared at Niall's fingertips. And if he wasn't away putting his ass on the line, he was at Talon HQ. They had a hard go of it for a while there. She gave her head a little shake and smiled again. The point is, he came back, and though there was even crazier shit that occurred after that, they made it. Cody will come back to you. You'll see. Remus might not be some big bad necromancer, but he's still dangerous, I whispered. If Cody gets hurt chasing him down, it's my fault. You know he doesn't believe that, and he'll be upset if you try to carry around all that blame. It's hard not to. He's only in this mess because of me. You know, she said, her brow arching, I'm pretty observant of, well, everyone. When Cody first came here, he was closed off and so serious all the time. He even got shit for scaring a group of Earth Summoners with his power. He did what? Oh, yeah. You can ask him about it. I heard it from Bry, who heard it from Zack, who... Never mind. My point is, Cody isn't doing anything he doesn't want to do. Seeing you two together is something else. She chuckled to herself. At least it took less time for the two of you to reach that point than Zack and Bry. Those two were a mess when they first met. I feel like I'm missing out on a ton of entertaining stories. You are. We'll have a girls' night soon, and you can hear all about them. And some about you and Jack? She laughed louder. Yeah, I can tell you how he got us sucked into a mirror, and how we were chased around by monsters. That was loads of fun. I moved the charm around on the chain a little more, then whispered, Cody said he loves me. What? When did that happen? She asked excitedly. Yesterday before you left. Talking about Cody reminded me of the dreams I had last night during the few hours I was able to sleep. He'd been sitting beside me on the couch, holding me and talking about nothing important. It was the best dream. If I concentrated hard enough, I could feel his strong arms around me. I do too. Love him, I mean. I thought there was a glow about you under all that anger. I can't believe my parents made him leave campus, or that they'd accuse him of being involved. It'll work itself out. And if it doesn't? A familiar sense of panic I hadn't felt in days, thanks to Cody, crept in. My breathing started to become faster. My hands shook, and I quickly lowered my left to my thigh. I tapped out to the count of five while holding on to the dragon charm with my other hand. After three times through the count, I was able to get ahead of the attack and calm down. From across the island, Nyala watched me with an anxious glance. I'm all right, I promised. They've gotten a lot easier to control. With any luck, I wouldn't have any major ones while Cody was gone. Yeah, and how's that going to work out? You know you need to get back to using your magic at some point. Who knows what kind of shit that's going to stir up. You're going to be a wreck, and Cody won't be here to help you not lose it. A knock at the door broke through my rambling thoughts. Nyala went to open it, and there was Jack, casually resting against the frame. He leaned in and gave her a sweet kiss, then waved at me. Morning, Meg. Are you holding up okay? I grumbled into my coffee. Did Cody ask everyone to keep an eye on me or something? Me, personally? No, but we look after our own in this group, he said with a laugh. You'll have to get used to it. Trust me, it's easier if you just give in he added in an exaggerated whisper. Nyala rolled her eyes and smacked his shoulder. It would have been easier. Instead, I had to chase you down and stop you from getting yourself killed. Jack grinned wider, lifted her off her feet, and kissed her again. You liked it. Flushed, Nyala mumbled a response that was too quiet for me to hear, but had Jack laughing. Right, she said louder. Ready to head down to breakfast? I grabbed my tote bag and joined the two of them for a stroll through the dorms and over to the main building. Briar and Zack were already at a table once we reached the dining hall. We sat down with them, and I listened to their conversation, chiming in here and there. If I said nothing, I was sure they would worry about me more. But I was going to be okay. I was. Even still, it didn't stop me from searching the hall for Cody. Sadly, he wasn't there. 
What I did notice, however, were two familiar faces from last semester. Those two are Talons, right? Hunter and Trish? I asked Briar. She glanced to where I nodded. Yep, that they are. Why are they here? I mean, I know Talons watch the campus, but usually they don't come inside, right? Those two looked like they were purposely standing watch inside the hall. I don't know. My brother must have given them a new assignment. Probably something to do with damage control over the wraiths attacking. Zack said casually, and went back to discussing some lost book rumor with Jack. I picked at the rest of my breakfast of bacon and scrambled eggs, not hungry after all. But I heard Cody's voice in my mind, reminding me to eat and not let stress get to me. About ten minutes until my first lecture, I got up to head to class. All four of the others did the same, trailing along with me in a group. I wasn't sure what they were doing. Briar and Zack had to go teach out on the grounds, and Nyala and Jack had a class in an entirely different building. I entered the lecture hall, said bye to them, and went to find my seat in the back. I brushed it off as if they were simply being supportive and paid attention to the lesson. Most of the day was spent listening to the students gossip about what had gone down over winter break with the wraiths. I'd anticipated hearing more of the same outlandish theories, and nothing much had changed. The official story was that one of the summoners from last semester who hadn't been captured had stuck around to carry out the second half of their original plan. It was as close to the truth as Hook could get without causing more trouble for everyone involved. Mostly me. By that afternoon, it wasn't rumors flying around that had my senses on high alert. There was something else going on. And it did have to do with me. Hunter and Trish were always close by, and they weren't the only ones. Nick and Luke Pierce showed up during the day, also keeping their distance, but obviously watching over me. They were dressed in plain clothes, blending in with the other students. Then a fifth Talon appeared that evening. He, too, was dressed casually, but he had the same air about him as the others. He whistled while he strolled alongside me. All right, seriously? I came to a stop on the sidewalk. After I got a better look at his face, I remembered seeing him around me all day, too. I'm sorry? He asked, an innocent smile playing over his face. Who are you? Chan Scott, he said and held out his hand. Pleasure to meet you. Wait, as in Jack Scott's little brother? That'd be me. Oh, come on! Cody put you up to this, didn't he? I glanced around, and sure enough, Hunter and Trish stood off near the willow trees about twenty yards away. And behind me, slowly heading my way, were Nick and Luke. This is ridiculous. I'm merely following orders, Chance said, obviously trying not to laugh. Five of you, though? Why does he think I need that many guards? I asked, trying to keep my voice down so the students around us wouldn't hear. It was the deal he made with General Pierce. I spun around at Luke's words. What deal? Cody was only willing to leave you here if you were adequately protected. Adam was in full agreement, seeing as this bastard went so far as to use wraiths against you. So, yes, there are plenty of us around to ensure your safety. So Cody can focus on his mission. Luke gave me an encouraging smile. Don't worry. After a few days, you won't even notice we're here. Well, she'll notice us, Nick argued. Cody asked us to keep up with your earth summoning. And technically, there are nine people watching out for you. Luke chimed in. Ten if you count Hook. Nick winked and started to laugh while I scowled at the three of them. It wasn't until he mentioned the headmaster that I belatedly realized I had seen Hook numerous times today, too. He'd been casually strolling nearby, but it was far more than I was used to seeing him out and about. I sighed and kept walking. I supposed I couldn't blame Cody for worrying so damn much. If this is what it took for him to be able to focus on finding Remus, I could handle being surrounded by a small army of bodyguards. At least I liked them, and they weren't working for my parents. Speaking of summoning, Nick said, keeping pace after Luke and Chance faded into the crowd of students milling about. When would you like to get started? I curled my hand tighter around the strap on my tote bag. I don't know if that's a good idea. You have nothing to worry about. My brother and I aren't that breakable. 
You let us know when you're good, and we'll be there. Maybe in a couple of days, just not right now. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. He stepped off the path. In seconds, I lost sight of him, too. Was Cody really that worried about me? Because of Remus? Or was he more concerned that I'd lose control of my magic and hurt someone? Ten guards were overkill. Uncertainty about why he wanted me so heavily watched over wouldn't leave me alone. When I reached my bedroom, I shut the door and paced around the room. He texted me that afternoon, saying he'd call me tonight. I circled my room, going around and around, until finally my phone rang. Hey, how was your first day of classes? He asked. His voice was deeper like it usually was when he was exhausted. Sounds like it might have been easier than yours. Everything okay there? Yeah, just a lot of information to sift through. My eyes are starting to cross. No solid leads yet, but once we find something, we'll be on the move. You'll text me before you set out, right? I will. Good. That's a... that's good. Meg? Are you all right? I held the dragon charm between my fingers and finally stopped my pacing. I'm just wondering how blind you think I am. A nervous cough came down the line. I don't. Is that right? So you thought I wouldn't notice the five talons keeping tabs on me, or that Nyala, Jack, Briar, and Zack are making it a point to be around me as much as possible during the day? Oh, and that apparently Hook is also in on it. Can you blame me? I hate that I'm not there with you. General Pierce worried that I'd become distracted, so he made certain you were well protected. And it's just to keep me safe. What else would it be for? The room closed in around me. I tried to keep my breathing steady, not wanting to let Cody know I was having trouble, but I failed miserably. Flashes of that wraith coming after him burst into life inside my mind. My magic swirled and shifted inside of me like the tide. I shut my eyes, willing the panic away. Cody's firm voice came through the line, piercing the haze that had crept into my mind. He was counting. After the third time through, he repeated my mantra to me. After the second time, I was able to tap out the count on my thigh. Once my breathing returned to normal, my knees turned to jelly, and I sank all the way to the floor with my back to the wall. Meg? he asked, his voice strained. I'm sorry. Don't do that. It's not your fault. I'm sorry I can't be there for you. Is that what the guards are for? I blurted. Just in case? There was a long beat of silence. Then he cursed. No. That thought hadn't even crossed my mind. They're there to protect you, Meg, because I can't be. If anything happens to you while I'm gone, I'll lose it. I trust you. I've always trusted you. I hung my head, mentally kicking myself. I should have known better. Sorry, I mumbled again. Stop. I get it. And I am sorry I didn't tell you about them all being there, but I hoped you wouldn't notice. I didn't want to stress you out. I've been followed by guards all my life, remember? They all act the same. How are you feeling now? Better. I miss you, I murmured. A lot. Same. Time will go by faster for you if you let others distract you. I'll try, but it's hard to do that when I know what you're going up against. I wish I could be there with you, to help you. This is my fight, too. It was your fight. Now it's mine. He sighed, and I could just see him sitting wherever he was, his hair a mess from a long day of research. He probably had worry lines on his face I couldn't soothe away. I wondered if he, too, was tapping out a rhythm of five to keep his own emotions in check. Talk about something else. Like what? Like what you want to do after this is all over? Be with you. I said without any hesitation. Whatever that might entail, I don't know, but it's what I want. I want to be free of my parents and start on a new path with you. Then that's what we'll do. Cody, no more worrying about what ifs. He cut me off gently. A second voice came through the line, sounding distant. Damn it, I have to go. I'll call you tomorrow night, okay? Keep me updated on everything. Promise? Promise. Good night, Meg. He hung up, and I sat on the floor for a moment longer, staring at the blank screen in my phone. Saying we could have a life together was one thing, but how are we going to make it work? 
One day at a time, I mumbled to myself and hauled my ass up off the floor. Just one day at a time. At the end of the first week of classes and after a few pep talks from Cody each night, I finally felt comfortable with attempting to use my earth summoning magic again. Nick had raised an earthen wall around the circle for me. Luke was with us too. I wasn't sure how it was going to be working with them. It only took me a few minutes to realize Cody had spoken with them about the best ways to help me work my magic without falling into a panic. By the end of the session, I was exhausted, but damn proud of myself. I hadn't let the fear get to me once. Thinking about Cody had helped keep me focused. You know, I wouldn't have guessed you'd only just started working with your magic, Luke said while Nick raised his hands and lowered the wall. You're certainly a natural with it. It's getting easier, but I can still feel the rest of my magic wanting out. Zack and Briar are working on a way to help with the spirit side of things, Nick mentioned, and she'll be able to work with fire, too, once you're up for it. My scars prickled. An echo of distant screams filled my ears. I tapped out to the count of five against my thigh, reminding myself I wasn't in that warehouse. Nick and Luke made it a few steps further before they turned and hurried back to me. Meg? Nick asked, then his eyes widened. Shit, I'm sorry. I shook my head, still counting silently until the painful tingling faded. No, it's fine. It's not your fault. Sometimes certain things bring back memories of that night. Sometimes they don't. But I think fire will be the last element I try to work with. That and air. Why air? Luke asked. Remus was an air summoner. I shook off the memories and forced a smile. I'm starving. I'm going to catch up with Nyala and the others in the dining hall. They exchanged a nervous glance but let it go. We were almost to the main building. Then Chance was there to take over for Luke and Nick. While they talked briefly, I glanced around the grounds. Several staff members stood near the main drive. One of them turned, and I blanched. A student passed between us, and the person I thought I'd seen was gone. Are you all right? Luke asked softly to my right. My parents didn't send anyone else to guard me, right? Right. Did you see someone? I started to nod, then I stopped. I had to be seeing things. My parents had never cared enough about me to send one of their personal guards to watch me. Why would they start now? No, nothing, I told Luke. I'm heading inside. I turned to go, noting Chance falling into step behind me. My parents might not care about me, but I was starting to realize that I'd gone and made myself a new family. A better family. And whatever happened, I wasn't going to lose them. Chapter 4 Cody That summoner we brought in paid off. Adam said, entering the conference room we'd been using as our home base for anything regarding the search for Remus Gorgrothus. He finally spoke, I asked. That he did. Adam handed me a piece of paper with several addresses on it. These are known locations for Remus to have been at one point or another. We have no idea if he resides at any of them still, but they're better than nothing at this point. I skimmed the locations. At the last one, I clenched my hand into a fist, even though this building was more metal than stone, the earth beneath the structure trembled at my silent call. That's only an hour away from Academy. Then we'll start there, first thing in the morning. Why not now? Because it's nearing midnight, and you need some damn sleep. He took the list back. We'll start fresh in a few hours. Arguing would get me nowhere. Something I'd learned these past few months was how stubborn all the Pierce brothers were. He wasn't wrong about my lack of sleep, though. I left the conference room and walked through the dimly lit corridors at Talon HQ. Most were sleeping at this hour, but there were several of our people on patrol or running missions of their own up and about. The one Adam and I worked on was classified. We had to tread carefully while searching for Remus. One wrong misstep, and not only could Megan's life be put in danger again, but word could leak out of her true last name. It was challenging. We'd been searching for two weeks now and had come up with hardly any intel on Remus. After the incident three years ago, the Gorgrithus family disappeared from all records. We'd gone to the family's estate in southwest Maine, in the middle of nowhere. It had been abandoned all these years. The mansion had been falling in on itself, and the expansive grounds were overgrown. 
It had been a long shot thinking he'd be there, but I hoped we'd gather something useful to get us started. There'd been nothing, no hint of the plans they'd had for the Vilsaris family, and certainly nothing with a massive alert over it telling me what Remus had planned for Megan if the wraiths failed. The summoner we'd picked up a week ago had mostly been by accident. He was a known associate of Remus from five years ago. His name had popped up along with a few others. The rumors had said that Gerald, the summoner, was known for drinking and using his summoning against mortals. He'd been picked up by Talons a few states over. The second his name had come across Adam's desk, he'd had the man transferred here. It had taken a couple of days to sober him up. After that, he'd refused to say a word about Remus. But Adam was a pierce. It hadn't taken much more than a day for Gerald to start giving us what information he could recall on his friend. I entered my room, shut the door, and sat down on the edge of my bed. I hadn't realized how damn tired I was until right then. My phone was on the nightstand, and I reached for it. There was a text from Megan, but it came in hours ago. She'd let me know her day had gone well enough, and that her earth summoning was slowly progressing. Even from this far away, I sensed her frustration that she couldn't do more. Except she was, as it turned out, when she had to. Unless that wasn't her doing. I fell back on the bed, thinking over all she'd told me about the voices she'd heard that day during the fight. I was mostly convinced they were simply a part of her that was waking up now that she was actively working to use her magic and take control of it. There was always a chance I was wrong, but my gut said I wasn't. Megan simply had to keep trusting in herself. And if she could reach that point where she could tap into her magic willingly to that extent, she was going to be beyond formidable. I wanted her to reach that point. I wanted her to have peace of mind, too, which meant finding Remus, if only the hunt for him wasn't taking so long. I texted Megan back that I was sorry I missed my chance to call her tonight, but I'd probably have news for her tomorrow. I set my phone aside, ready to crash. Then it vibrated with an incoming text. When I saw Megan's name, I sat up all the way. Is it too late to call now? Wondering why she was up this late, I didn't bother texting back. She answered on the first ring. What are you still doing awake? I asked. She laughed. Wow, really? Isn't it bad enough that I have a parade of bodyguards following me around? Now you're going to lecture me about my sleeping habits? Honestly, what am I going to do with you? I can think of a few things. I mumbled, knowing she was lying in bed and wondering if she was wearing the sweater I'd left behind. I missed falling asleep beside her. Soon. We'd be back together soon. And I'm assuming your protection detail isn't actually walking around in a parade formation. Feels like it. From her tone, I could picture her disgruntled frown. But I get why they're here, so I'm doing my best not to complain. Is that what this is? You know, I think I'm going to turn in for the night, she said, her tone teasing. Now that's just being mean. I fiddled with the edge of the blanket on my bed, sensing she was trying to sound like she was in a good mood for my sake. Tell me honestly, are you sleeping okay? Are you? I miss you, I said without any hesitation. I never thought I'd have someone with me after the person I turned into. My days feel quieter than they should be. And no, I'm not sleeping okay. If I'm not dreaming about Remus attacking you, then I'm seeing... I cut myself off and grunted. Never mind. No, tell me, she said softly. What else do you see when you close your eyes? This was where I'd lose her. I'd tell her the truth and it'd be too much. But I wanted her to know. Needed her to. I see us together. We're sitting on the porch of a quaint cottage or where are... Well, let's just say we don't always stay on the front porch. Megan's warm laughter flowed through the line, and I relaxed. And you think I don't have those dreams? She fell quiet for a moment, then said softer, The nightmares, too? I hate that you got dragged into the mess that my life is. I like the mess, I told her honestly. Without you, I'm not sure I would have ever felt anything again. Sitting up, I rested my back against the wall. You've helped me find a way to cope with my past while moving forward, without turning into a heartless piece of shit. I don't think you were ever heartless. It was just buried beneath the pain. I understand that. I shut my eyes and pictured her in as much detail as possible. I wish I was there right now. Me too, 
It's been weird falling asleep without you next to me, she admitted. We might be one step closer to me coming back to you. You finally got a lead on Remus? Potentially. I'll let you know more tomorrow night. Whatever you're doing tomorrow, be careful. Always. I attempted and failed to smother a yawn. Damn it. Get some sleep. Hearing your voice for a little while will get me through the night. Same. Good night, Meg. Night, Cody. We hung up, and I lay down. In seconds, my eyes were slipping closed. In less than a minute, I was out. Dreaming of Megan and me on that front porch without a care in the world. There are four more places after this one. I pulled the SUV over to the curb and put it in park. If they turn up empty, you do not have permission to scare the piss out of Gerald, Adam warned. I'm not sure you'd be able to control yourself. I'd be fine. Yeah, well, I'm not taking that chance. You've been on edge all damn day. I turned the vehicle off and climbed out. I hadn't told him why I'd woken up in a shit mood. What had been pleasant dreams for the first part of the night had quickly soured until I'd bolted upright, fearing for Megan's life. Remus had her trapped in a cage surrounded by wraiths. We'd been back in that haunted house from the fall festival. It was hours later, and Megan's scream continued to taunt me. The ground shook beneath my feet. A gust of cold air blew past my face in warning, and I willed my magic back into myself. There aren't even any humans around, I complained. And... We're not here to draw attention to ourselves. Adam and I had left our official Talon uniforms behind for the day. The list of locations Gerald had given us took us to one small summoner town after another, most within a few hours' drive of Talon HQ or the old Gorgothus estate. Yesterday morning, we'd taken the time to drive to the one closest to Academy. That had turned up empty. The barn that was supposed to be on that tiny spit of land hadn't even been there anymore. It had killed me to be so close to Megan. Adam had stopped me from driving to go and see her, reminding me that I had a job to do. The sooner it was completed, the sooner Megan and I could get on with our lives. Today I'd hoped to get through the remaining locations by the end of today. But the sun was getting low in the sky. We'd have to hit the second half of the list tomorrow. The ground trembled once more. Adam shot me a sideways glare, and I mumbled an apology under my breath. There really wasn't anyone near us. The town we'd pulled into, if it could even be called a town still, was way past the time when it was a bustling place. It had the same run-down, ghost-town vibes the other locations had given off. We were on what had been once a side street, flooded with boutique shops. The main thoroughfare was only a few shop fronts to our south. Now most of the windows were boarded up or broken. There was a gas station that was up and running, and a small convenience store. A motel wasn't too far down from that, and was the only place that had a couple of vehicles parked out front. The building in front of us, the one Gerald had told us about, had been a bookstore once upon a time. The brick structure was three stories with a hidden basement, according to our source. Adam led the way forward toward a front door that was hanging by a single hinge. The front doors were covered in plywood all the way to the top floor. I waited to sense any kind of magical protection on the place. The last few locations had none. If this one was the same, we wouldn't find any answers here. Once we reached the front door, however, the scars on my back gave a twinge. I grabbed Adam's arm, stopping him. Wait. Do you feel something? Maybe. It's faint. Adam told me to step back. Then he raised his hand. A condensed ball of swirling air formed in his palm. He drew back his arm and unleashed it. The orb turned into a cyclone that crashed into the building. A rippling of red sparks ignited and went out in a blink. It was certainly older, Adam commented while the wind dissipated, and he lowered his hand. But not that old. He nodded to me, and I readied my magic. Together we climbed the three steps and entered the shop. The air was musty and hazy from the amount of dust floating around. Bookshelves lined the walls and created a maze on the first floor. There was a counter near the front door, and a display of some new thriller sitting beside an old register. Signs hanging from the ceiling pointed visitors towards various sections. The top floor was reserved for magical texts. The sign retained some of the magic left to shield it from the humans who might have entered the shop. The words on it flickered in and out of sight. The second floor was history and other non-fiction themes. We split up and walked the perimeter. 
Gerald had only said there was a hidden basement, not how to find it. Too bad there wasn't a helpful arrow pointing in that direction. I stepped up onto a raised platform near the rear of the shop. Unlike the rest of the floor, these boards didn't creak or shift under my weight. A slight tingling climbed up my legs. I whistled to get Adam's attention. Groaning floorboards announced his arrival. I pointed to my feet. The air swarmed around us, and Adam nodded. I stepped backward. He brought his hands down, and a swirl of air crashed into the floor, shattering the illusion. A metal trap door appeared. A red sigil was burned on its surface, but Adam's magic had already cracked it. The magic slipped out of it, and the sigil went dark. Using the small groove as a handhold, he pulled it up. What little light was inside the shop was barely enough to illuminate a narrow set of wooden stairs descending into pitch blackness. We pulled out the small flashlights from our pockets and descended into the dark. At the bottom, there was a switch. Adam flipped it on, and a string of four bare bulbs lit up a dingy dirt floor cellar. And hanging from the walls were photographs of Megan. Some of her were out in a garden of some kind. There were more of her sitting at what appeared to be formal events. Others were of her on campus. There were even a few taken through a window of what I assumed was the chateau she'd stayed at with her parents before coming to Academy last fall. The ground roiled, and the walls of the cellar shook. Cody, we need this place not to collapse, Adam said gently, not even turning my way. I ground my teeth. Sweat broke out on my forehead. The nightmare I'd had of Megan and Remus appeared right before my eyes. Cody. I let out a shaky breath and mentally counted to five inside my head. I forced my eyes to close and continued the count. Megan was safe at Academy. She was safe. Remus might not be here, but I was one step closer to tracking him down. I swallowed hard and tucked my magic away for a second time. Adam stood over to the side, looking over a table I hadn't noticed yet. There are plans here for how to create a source point to bring the wraiths through, he told me. And these are the summoners who'd been hired to stalk the other students. Remus had been here recently then. We'd missed him by only a few weeks, maybe. The other locations probably won't have anything, but we'll check them out anyway. Adam shuffled through another stack of papers. He's got pictures of her parents, too. Great. I stared at the photograph of Lucy and William Wright. They were smiling. How could they be so happy after what they'd put their daughter through? Have any threats been made against them? I asked. None that have been reported to me. However, they've always had their own private security. Do you think Remus is targeting them, too? I don't know. Megan killed Raven and the rest of the Gorgrithus family in the warehouse. But she was only there because they'd planned to go after her parents. I doubt he's going to stop with Megan. I'll see if I can't place some extra eyes at the Academy of Ancients Council meeting house. He pulled out his phone to send the order, while I continued to work through the mess of papers left behind. There was nothing saying what he wanted to do with Megan. If the wraiths were any indication, he wanted her to suffer a horrible, painful death. That, however, seemed far too easy. He had to have a bigger plan in place. Maybe something tied to what they were? what the Villasar's family was capable of. Megan had told me her parents were only adept at using one element each. There wasn't a chance Remus would believe that. And after what Megan had done against the wraiths, he'd know what she'd done at the warehouse to save herself hadn't been a fluke. A tiny slip of paper caught my eye, jutting out from under an old paint can that had been used to hold down a map. The map turned out to be of Academy's campus, though it was over a decade old. There were several places marked on it that were known to be secret ways in and out of the mountain. Hook had them sealed up years ago, but after the fight with Xylon, some of them must have reopened. I pointed it out to Adam. He grumbled another few curses and said he was going to make a call to the headmaster. While he was on the phone with Hook, I picked up that slip of paper. There was a name scribbled on it, the handwriting just legible. Cyclone Alley. It was a club, but that was a cover for the business that was usually carried out there. I held up the paper to Adam. It was the only lead we had. There was nothing to suggest a time or date. We'd have to stake the place out and hope we got lucky. Adam nodded and made a wrap-it-up motion with his hand. 
I gathered the papers off the table and yanked down all the photographs of Megan from the wall. The last one was of us at the fall festival. She was laughing. God, she looked so happy at that moment. My stomach twisted, and I fought against the rising nausea. Remus had been there. He'd been so damn close, and I'd missed my chance to catch him. I wasn't going to miss him again. I tucked the photographs under my arm with the rest of the papers, shut off the light in the cellar, and followed Adam to the SUV. With a jerk of my head, the ground beneath the bookstore opened, and the building collapsed on itself. Imagining trapping Remus under the rubble brought a smile to my face. Chapter 5. Meg. I checked my cell, but there weren't any messages from Cody yet today. It was nearing nine in the evening. I couldn't stop from being antsy that there'd been no word from him all day. He'll contact you when he can, Nyala said, sitting next to me on the couch. I know, I know, I just really hate this. Huh, you're in good company, Briar commented. She was sitting in the armchair in Nyala's apartment, hanging out with us for a few hours. You're talking to the queen of going stir-crazy. She and Nyala had been doing a good job these last few days of keeping my mind busy. That, and with the earth summoning lessons, there'd hardly been time to overthink the trouble Cody might be getting himself into. I glanced at my phone again and sighed. Nyala gave me a friendly nudge. Why don't you think about something else? She suggested. Like what? Like what else has been bugging you this week? Briar said. You keep doing this thing where you get an elated smile on your face, and two seconds later, you look like you're about to go terrorize someone. Then you get sad. You can tell all that from my face? I asked. Briar shrugged. All right, maybe Zach's been noticing your aura doing some major shifts these days. What's up with you? I pulled my feet up under me. It was weird for me to have people to confide in. Sometimes it still threw me off. If I'd ever tried to talk about any of this stuff with my parents, they'd remind me about how dangerous being a Villaceris was, and that I'd never have the life I dreamed about. My life would be about keeping myself tucked away and out of sight, of making the world think I had no magic so I would be safe, so I could pretend I was the perfect daughter and not cause them trouble. Meg? Nyala asked. It's Cody, I told them. Well, not just him, really. It's about what comes after all this. What do you mean? He catches Remus, and you no longer have to look over your shoulder. Briar made it sound so damn simple. I knew all the shit she and Zach had gone through. Hell, Nyala and Jack, too. They'd made it work. I wanted to believe Cody and I could, too. But they didn't know my parents. They didn't realize how far they'd go to keep me under their control. But then what? I asked softly. I finish up my time in Academy, even though I won't ever be able to use the other elements while I'm here, without exposing who I am. How am I going to get the training I need? And Cody lives at Talon HQ. If I walk away from my family, I have nothing. I doubt they'll let me tap into my inheritance. I'm not trained to do anything at all. I don't even know what I want to do with my life. I've never thought that far ahead. I never cared to until I met him. I'd never let myself hope for anything different. Briar and Niall exchanged a look that had them grinning. What are you two thinking about? I asked. Well, for starters, I happen to own an estate that has more than enough room for you and Cody to live there for a while, Briar said. And Jack's home's on the larger side, too, Niall informed me. We've been talking about magically combining our places using a two-way mirror spell. You could live with either one of us. You could even bounce back and forth if you wanted. For however long you would need to, you've got a home with us, Briar added. See? Already solved one of your problems. What? No, we couldn't just move in with you guys, I argued. Why the hell not? Briar leaned over and patted me on the shoulder. Listen, once upon a time, Academy became the only place I could call home. I know what it's like to feel like you have nowhere to go, that you have no family. But you have one, Meg, one that cares about you way more than those sorry excuse for parents do. Bry, seriously? Nyala scolded. What? She's not wrong, I said through my laughter. You're both really sure about this? 
If we weren't, we wouldn't have said anything. Nyala's scowl turned into a grin again. Now, the next order of business is figuring out what you want to do. I know for a fact that though you might not be able to get the training you need here, Zack's brother Adam would be more than willing to have you at Talon HQ. It'd be safe there, too, for you to use all your magic without fear of someone blabbing about it to the rest of the world. I think keeping my true abilities secret is what started this mess. I held out my hands in front of me. My scars peeked out from the edge of my sleeves. Despite everything my parents told me growing up, I found stories about our family dating back centuries. My ancestors helped people, summoners and non-summoners alike. They were in complete control of their magic and used it for good. It never turned on them for trying to shove it away and pretend it didn't exist. It wasn't until the last few generations that people like the Gorgrithus family turned against them and created so much fear that everything got messed up. Sounds like going to town HQ would be a good first step, Briar said with a slow nod. The Academy of Ancients Council will never be what it used to be, according to everything I've heard. But the Talons, they've made great strides in doing what they were originally created to do. But having someone like you on the Council would be helpful too. They're still dealing with weeding out corruption. I'm not sure I have the mind for politics, I admitted to Nyala. Taking the same path as my parents does not sound appealing. Well, if nothing else, you have a knack for earth summoning. Be a gardener, Briar mused. I burst out laughing. A gardener, huh? Why not? The point is, she said, shifting to the edge of her seat, your future is open to you. Do what you want, Meg. Don't let anyone hold you back. You've got us to support you no matter what you choose, Nyala added. She took one of my hands and Briar held the other. Like she said, we're family. Tears burned in my eyes, and I sniffed hard, not wanting to turn into a crying mess on the couch. I wanted so badly to take them up on their offer. It'd give me a chance to have a fresh start and figure out what I wanted with my life. And I could be with Cody without having to worry about my parents. Except they remained my biggest obstacle after Remus. Over the years, I'd rebelled against them in small ways. Then there was the incident with Raven. I'd seen how well that ended. But up and leaving them? That was going to mean standing up to them and not letting them break me down like I usually did. Cody and my new family couldn't do that for me. I had to be the one to break the connection to them for good. Briar's cell chimed. She picked it up off the coffee table and checked it. Right, Zack says the grounds are clear. Ready for your first spirit summoning lesson? I gulped. If I say no, you'll be fine. Briar waved away my worry, got up and headed for the door. Come on, Meg, the night's a-wasting. Should I be worried that she sounds way too excited about this? I asked Nyala. You should always worry when Bri sounds excited about something. She replied with a laugh. But she's damn good at spirit summoning, as is Zack. You're in good hands. I'll see you guys in a bit. Unsure how this was going to work without alerting the rest of campus that I could use more than just earth summoning magic, I gave in and followed Briar out the door. Not surprisingly, Nick and Luke joined us in the hallway. I was getting used to having so many people following me around now. It helped that I trusted them over the guards my parents had always placed on me. They had always reported every detail of my life back to my parents. These were part of my new extended family. Briar chatted away about the Morris estate while we set off for the grounds and the spirit summoning training grounds. The place sounded incredible. She promised to have Nyala tell me more about her and Jack's place tomorrow. Zack waited for us inside the circle. Evening, Meg. No need to look so worried. It's hard not to. We were out in the open. Anyone could see us. Is this really a good idea? My brothers have us covered. Illusion spell. He nodded behind me. I turned enough to see Luke and Nick working a spell that quickly surrounded us. Now it looks like the grounds are empty. Briar stepped into the circle, giving me an encouraging smile. I hesitated a second longer, thought of Cody's words telling me I could do this, and joined them inside the stones. You know there's a chance nothing will happen, I warned. Or it'll go to shit in seconds. We're prepared, Briar said, without sounding concerned at all. What you need to do right now is focus on what you've already done with spirit summoning. 
Though I'll admit creating shields the way you did against the wraiths was insanely awesome. As was the power boost. But, she said in a rush after a look from Zack, tonight we're starting with the basics. Which sucks, by the way. It only sucked for you because you hated meditating, Zack said with a scowl. And I'm not one to sit around and do nothing. I've gotten better. Zack rolled his eyes, but he was grinning. Please have a seat, Meg, and we'll get started. A sliver of panic slipped down my spine. My hands tensed and I couldn't breathe for a second. I imagined Cody standing beside me, thought of his arms holding me, and felt his kiss atop my head. The panic dissipated without me even having to count. I let out a shaky breath and waited until they were steady before I went to take a seat across from Zack and Briar. Ready, I told them. I'm ready. Chapter 6 Cody Good news? Adam asked. I tucked my cell phone away and nodded. Zack just sent me an update on Meg's summoning training. She's picking up spirit damn fast from what he's saying. According to everything he'd reported this past week, Megan only had a minor panic attack once. It was more than good news, but damn, I hated not being there to see her coming into her magic. She promised once she saw me again she'd show me everything she'd been able to do so far. She'd even mentioned starting to work with Nyala on water summoning soon enough. I hadn't bothered to ask her about air and fire. I knew well enough those two elements would be the hardest for her to contend with. When she started those lessons, I wanted to be by her side. I trusted her. I didn't trust her memories not to find a way to turn her magic against her. Casually, I took a sip of my beer and glanced around the club. We'd been staking out Cyclone Alley, waiting for Remus to show his face. Adam and I had found a table on the second floor of the club that gave us a view of the front entrance and the main door. The place was too large for us to cover on our own. He'd pulled the only two talons he trusted beyond a doubt. Nick and Luke were somewhere down below, blending in with the clubgoers. Megan had asked me what they were up to the day Adam pulled them from her guard detail. I had let her know as much as I could without making her worry and had reminded her that just because they were absent from campus did not mean she should slack on her earth summoning. I felt the eye roll through that phone call, but she'd promised she would. Loud music blared from the speakers in the club. Adam was using his air summoning to create a pocket around us so we could hear each other talk without having to shout. The comms in our ears kept us in constant contact with Nick and Luke. Dancers filled the center of the floor below. More high-top tables lined the perimeter. Booths were tucked into the walls. The second floor was more of the same high-top tables with larger corner booths. The third floor was off-limits, unless you were here for business. That business being anything to do with the black market trade, or hiring someone to do a job ranging from theft to murder. Adam had told me how many times the talents had tried to shut this place down. Each time the assholes had a warning they were about to be raided, there was never any proof of the illegal activities taking place. Even after all the shit that went down with Briar and clearing out the corrupt masters and their lackeys, more remain. Adam had complained on the way here that first day. Corruption at its finest. As much as I agreed with him, this place was our only solid lead to finding Remus right now. Without this club acting as it had been for years, we might not get a new lead. However, this was our third day of staking out the place. They really needed to find a new soundtrack. The bass pounding through every inch of the building grated on my nerves. I closed my hand tighter around my beer and thought of the only thing able to calm me down. Megan. You'll see her again soon, I reminded myself. Then we can have that talk about moving to the Morris estate. She called me to talk about the idea a few nights ago. I'd been shocked at first. Then, excited by the idea, she'd rambled on about still working out the kinks of the plan and how she was going to have to face her parents at some point. And it was only if I wanted to leave the room I had at Talon HQ. I'd finally said her name a few times to get her attention. You hate the idea, don't you? She'd whispered. I knew it. I'm sorry. I got ahead of my... I love it. I'd corrected. Wait, really? Yes, really. I'd said through a laugh. If Bri and Zack are all right with it, I am too. Okay, yeah, uh, 
then I'll talk to them again and kind of start getting things figured out. She'd burst out laughing. That sound had touched my soul, hearing her so damn thrilled at the idea of us moving in together. I don't know what I'll do about my parents, but I'll figure it out. Whatever you need, I'll be right beside you. I'd promised. Always. Adam nudged my leg under the table, jarring me from my reminiscing. Three o'clock, at the bar. You got eyes? He asked his brothers. Leaning back in my chair and making it look as if I was taking in the dancers, I shifted my gaze toward the bar on the first floor. The man in question was tall and lanky. He wore black pants with a red silk shirt. His long hair was smoothed back. When he turned and I spotted his sharp cheekbones, I nearly shattered the beer bottle in my hands. Remus, I breathed. Confirmed, Luke said through the comms. Remus is here. Keep close, but don't let him spot you. Nick laughed at Adam's order. Who are you talking to, brother? We're the stealthiest assholes in the world. Adam scowled, but made no reply. I watched Remus without looking straight at him. He remained at the bar for a while, until the bartender came over and slipped him something that might have been a piece of paper. I was too far away to tell. Remus looked at it, then turned and made for the stairs heading up to the second level. I hunched over the table, my back to where he'd ascend. He knew who I was, and though I had an illusion spell weaved over my face, I wasn't going to risk him marking us before we were able to get the drop on him. Adam's changing expression to a sour frown told me once Remus had reached the second floor. He's heading to the third level. He whispered, You guys won't be able to follow him up there. Says who? Luke replied. If you two get yourselves in trouble, I'm not coming to save you. Adam warned. Such a worrywart. Nick teased. We've got this. A few seconds later, Adam's eyes narrowed. I assumed Nick and Luke had headed for the third floor, too. Our plan beyond this point was hardly one. We wanted to apprehend Remus, but we had no idea if he was here alone or if he had people waiting to jump in and protect him if he was attacked. The third floor was also a mystery. We'd have to wait for him to come back down and follow him out of the club. It was our safest option, too. There were far too many innocents inside the club to risk anything else. I finished my beer and pushed the empty bottle to the center of the table. Crackling static filled the comms. I started to ask Adam what the interference was. Then Nick cursed, and Luke yelled. Howling drowned out the music. A gust of wind with a force of a damn tempest rushed down the stairs, slamming into the second floor. Adam raised his hands, creating a shield of air. It shoved us back but allowed us to remain upright. Two bodies rolled down the metal steps in the wake of the wind. The music cut off, and people ran screaming for the exit. Adam and I ran to the two figures, grunting and struggling to get to their feet. Luke and Nick appeared dazed, but otherwise unharmed. What the fuck happened? Adam snapped. An unexpected guest. Luke opened his eyes wider and shook his head. One of General Erickson's men is here. Erickson, I thought you locked her up months ago. We did, but some of her people escaped capture, Nick commented. The club trembled, and he glowered up the stairs. Is Remus still up there? I asked. He's the one that unleashed that windstorm, Nick told me. Yeah, he's still... Cody, wait! I charged up the stairs. A mix of frantic voices was shouting about packing up and hauling ass out of there. Remus. I had to get to Remus before he escaped. The stones in the building rumbled with every step I took. At the top of the steps, I had a second to take in the wide open space, cluttered with crates, a massive safe, two desks near it, and windows on the far wall. Up here, the old stone walls were exposed, making it far easier for me to pull on them. Near the desks stood Remus, arguing with another man. Why the fuck did you bring talons here? The man shouted at Remus. They're back! Someone else yelled. Two men charged forward, fire coiling around their hands. I ducked under their attacks and reached my hand toward the stone wall. Hunks of rock slammed into the fire summoners, bashing their heads and taking them to the floor. With my other hand, I summoned more stones and aimed them at Remus. The man beside him dove to the side. Remus smirked. 
Inches away from smashing into him, the stone struck an invisible barrier. Red sigils flared to life all around his body. The stones turned to dust and fell. The bastard had warded himself. Cody, is it? He called out to me. So good to finally meet you face to face. Tell me, how is our dear sweet Megan these days? I glared back at him in answer. Around me, the others that had been up here began to close in. Remus's grin stretched wider. That's all right, he said as if we were having a casual conversation among friends. I'll be seeing her soon enough. Footsteps pounded up the stairs behind me. Remus snapped his fingers, and the air in the room created a vortex, dragging everyone toward him. Then he snapped his fingers again. A massive, swirling cyclone exploded outward. Remus didn't spare anyone from his wrath. I braced myself, but the wind was too powerful. The winds blew out, taking half the wall with them. Through the clutter of debris swept up in the wind, I spotted Remus step over the edge and jump from the third floor like I was nothing. Pulling on my magic, I attempted to use the stones to pummel him, but the wind slammed me into a wall, yanked me away, then threw me toward that opening. The floor disappeared from beneath me, and there was only open space. For a horrifying second, I was free-falling. Then a second gust of air wrapped around my legs and yanked me up into the building once more. I hit the floor and rolled to my back. Adam stood over me, out of breath. His face was pinched in anger. You good? he asked. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Next time, when we tell you to wait, you wait. He offered me his hand and none too gently hauled me upright. Gauze is almost as bad as working with Briar again, he added under his breath. He got away. Yeah, I know. Adam waved his hand around the room. But we have plenty of people here to question who might know where he's headed. Get them rounded up. I've already placed a call for backup. They'll be here in ten. Can you trust them? At some point, we knew we'd have to bring more people in on what we're doing. He reminded me, They're talons. I know there's a lot of shit going on in the council, and you're worried about Megan. But this unit has been your family all these years, just as it's been mine, just as it was your parents. We'll try to keep Megan's real name out of it, but no, you're right, I interrupted. If you trust them, then I do too. I should have. Just everything with Meg and how she's been targeted has made me paranoid. Understandably so. Adam slapped me on the back. We'll catch that son of a bitch before he hurts Meg again. I went to help Nick and Luke detain the summoners Remus had left behind in his wake. There were eleven in all, including the man Remus had been talking to. We loaded them into transport vehicles once they arrived, and started the long drive back to Talon HQ. Why are we at Academy? I asked Adam. It was two days after we encountered Remus at Cyclone Alley. None of the summoners we'd brought in had given us any useful information. The man in charge, the one Remus had gone to meet, had only said he'd been searching for some sort of honing crystal. What it was for, Remus hadn't told the man. Despite finding the bookstore hideout and running into Remus at the club, we were back to having no idea what his plan was for Megan, or where he was holed up. I need to have a word with Hook, Adam explained, driving the car up the long drive toward the main building. Night had fallen on our drive here. I'd been too lost in my thoughts to pay much attention to where Adam had been taking me. He'd merely said he had to consult with someone, and told me to tag along. I plan to stay the night. We'll leave at dawn. I'm sure you can find yourself a suitable room to sleep in and get some much-needed rest. Thanks for this. You're welcome. He parked the car and I was out the door in a shot. I jogged to the dorms, up the stairs, and all the way down the corridor to Megan's apartment. Hunter and Trish stood outside the door. On my approach, they informed me Nyala had just left to spend the night with Jack. They grinned and said they'd be around. I raised my hand to knock on the door, unable to stop shifting on my feet. My heart raced. Too long. It had been too long since I'd seen her. Talking to her over the phone wasn't nearly enough. The door opened. The sight of Megan standing there in my sweater and those damned sleep shorts of hers unraveled me. Her hair was dragged back in a messy braid. Cody? 
I only have until dawn, I told her. I'll take it. She broke out into a grin and threw herself at me. I lifted her off her feet in a hug and backed us into the apartment, pulling the door shut behind me. I carried her all the way to the kitchen island and sat her down on it. Gods, I missed you, I whispered and leaned in to kiss her. Her lips were soft and warm and invited me to kiss her again and again. She wrapped her legs around my waist, drawing me into her even closer. You just had to be wearing my sweater. I've slept in it every night since you've been gone. She pressed her lips to mine once more, drawing out the moment. I could get lost in her every hour for the rest of my life and be content. I do have some news to share with you, I told her, about what's been going on. Can it wait a while longer? I was gonna say no. Then I slid my hands up her thighs to her hips, then under the sweater to press against her back. She was so damn warm. My hands went higher, and I cursed at the feeling of so much bare skin. Meg. Mm -mm. I kissed her neck while my hands roamed. Her breath hitched, and she hugged me to her until there was no space left between us. After I made my way back to her mouth with mine, I took my time, thinking of all those moments we'd missed out on recently. We paused to catch our breath, and her gaze latched onto mine. She smoothed her hands up my chest. Her lips curled into a smile. I lifted her off the counter, and our laughter trailed behind us while I carried her down the hall to her room and closed her door. She was right. Everything else could wait. Chapter 7 Meg Absently, I ran my fingers over the rim of my coffee mug. I hadn't been able to stop daydreaming and grinning about Cody's last visit for the past three days. I'd resigned myself to not seeing him for weeks. Then he'd shown up out of nowhere. It had been good for both of us, even if he'd had to sneak out of my apartment just before dawn broke. Once we'd had a chance to make up for lost time, we'd laid in bed and he caught me up on everything that had gone on so far in the hunt for Remus. I'd freaked out after he told me about running into that bastard at the club. I checked him over for injuries again. He'd assured me he wasn't hurt. He'd been chucked out of a building, though. I was allowed to worry. He'd captured my hands and held them clasped between us. I promise you I'll get them soon, he'd said. If I hadn't been so careless, I might already have. I don't blame you, I'd replied. I would have done the same. He'd pushed his fingers through my hair and ran his hand down my back. I'd snuggled closer, soaking in the feeling of being so close to him. He'd changed the conversation to how my summoning was coming along. I told him a bit about how Briar was helping me work on mentally communicating using spirit energy. But it was slow coming. Usually it just left me with a headache. I'd tried to stay awake until he had to go. At some point, though, I dozed off, curled up in his arms. He'd woken me with a sweet kiss to my forehead, promised he'd see me soon, and tucked me in. You ready for a lesson this morning? Huh? I glanced up at Nick and Luke, standing near the table in the dining hall. It's Saturday. And? Luke said through a laugh. Come on, you've made some decent progress. And we were gone for like four days. Time to get back at it. I practiced while you were away. Did you? Nick asked, and I beamed back at him. That's what I thought. Up and at it, Meg. I drained the rest of my coffee and followed them out of the busy dining hall. I hadn't seen Nyala all morning. Either she was with Jack in his apartment still, sleeping in, or they were already in the library somewhere, working on research for whatever project they had going on. Those two could get lost in records and books for days. Briar and Zach were gone taking care of something at the Morris estate. I had a feeling that had to do with Cody and me moving in soon. She'd seemed so ecstatic about something yesterday. When I'd asked her what, she'd shrugged and said I'd just have to wait and see. While Nick, Luke, and I made our way across the grounds, I couldn't stop my thoughts from shifting back to Cody and his hunt for Remus. Hearing he'd been chucked out of a building during their last encounter did nothing to ease my mind. He'd been pissed at himself, too, for letting Remus escape. I tried to remind him that we knew this wasn't going to be easy. I sure as hell didn't blame Cody. I wished more than anything I could be by his side, helping him. At this point, though, I'd be more of a liability than assistance. Soon, I muttered to myself. What was that? 
Luke asked. Nothing, just wishing things were different. We get it, Nick chimed in. Cody's not a weak summoner. He'll be all right. It'd be best to think about what comes next. It'll help you both get through this mess. Trust us. At least we do sort of have a plan now. That's step one, Luke said and waved his hand at the earth summoning circle we'd reached. Step two is continuing to master these gifts of yours. Step in and let's see what you've got today. I entered the circle and shook out my hands. Just as I was ready to work on clearing my mind the best I could and tap into the swirling vortex of magic within me, a familiar shout rang out across the grounds. Megan Wright, you step out of that circle right now. Mom? Stunned and confused, I stared at the small group of people approaching. Mom and Dad stalked toward me with all their personal guards in tow. Headmaster Hook was with them. His face was red, and he was arguing with my parents about how they were overreacting. Nick and Luke shifted into protective stances a little in front of me and stayed one on each side. Their hands were relaxed at their sides, but the earth trembled beneath my feet. What are you doing? Mom demanded once they'd reached us. What does it look like I'm doing? I replied without thinking. Answer your mother. Dad's eyes narrowed on Nick and Luke and step away from them. No, I told them and turned to Mom. And all I'm doing is learning how to improve my earth summoning, the same element you control. I don't see the issue. Mom's hands clenched into fists. You know the rules. All we've ever asked of you is not to cause trouble. Yet, in these last weeks, you've done everything to put yourself in the middle of these situations. You've drawn far too much attention to yourself. The only one bringing attention to me right now is you. What was she thinking? If she wasn't careful, she was going to expose the family secret right here in the middle of campus. How did she even know what I was up to? Why are you here? Dad squared his shoulders and marched toward me. Did you really think you could keep it a secret from us forever? I gulped, telling myself he couldn't know about Cody and me. It wasn't possible. Again, all I'm doing is training and learning, which is what's expected of me at a magical academy, I said, willing my voice to remain steady. Dad grabbed hold of my arm and dragged me away from Nick and Luke. I sensed them move in, but I held up my hand, stopping them. I wasn't about to let this turn into a worse situation. While Dad had me in his grip, a figure moved into sight behind him. It was one of their guards. My stomach plummeted. Winston. I knew I'd spotted him the other day. He'd been here on campus probably the entire time after they made Cody leave. He'd been here acting as my parents' eyes and ears, telling my parents everything about what I'd been doing. My stomach dropped impossibly more. Had he seen Cody sneak into my apartment the other night? Shit, I whispered, and Dad scoffed. Even after we order him banned for Academy, he finds a way to sneak back in. Dad leaned in and whispered, You will never see Cody Aethers again, do you understand? Never again. He's been nothing but trouble for this family. He straightened and turned around me to face the others. We're taking our daughter out of Academy. What? I exclaimed at the same time Hook did. Mr. Wright, William, please. There's no need to deprive Megan of her lessons, Hook said in a rush. She's been doing well here. She knows the rules and she broke them, Dad said simply. She's coming with us. Be thankful we're not here to do more than that. Are you threatening me? Hook asked and fire sparked at his fingertips. Not yet. Make more of a scene, and there may come a day when the council decides you are no longer fit to be headmaster here. Dad dragged me further away. Mom joined us and reached into my pocket to take away my cell phone. I had no way to contact Cody now. We're leaving, Dad announced loudly. Nick and Luke came forward again, but I shook my head. Neither of them looked ready to listen to me. Silently, I told them what I needed them to do. Cody had to know what was happening. The Pierce brothers would have to let him know for me. Hook opened his mouth to keep arguing, but I said loudly, It's fine. I'll go with you. Just stop being assholes to everyone, all right? 
You're right, I broke the rules, and I chose to have a relationship with Cody. Dad's hand tightened around my arm. I winced. Hook's glare slipped to where I was being held, and his eyes burned with his fire. For a second, I considered yanking myself free and calling out my parents for everything they'd done. But Dad was right. They held too much sway with the council. If I wasn't careful, I'd be bringing down hell on not just Hook's head, but the Pierce brothers, too. They'd already managed to get Cody forcibly removed. What lengths would they go to next? Thank you for allowing me to attend, I told Hook sincerely. He let out a heavy breath. You are more than welcome to return at any time. As if we'd let that happen, Mom told him. Let's go, Megan. Can I at least pack my things? It's being taken care of, she informed me. I worried about who she'd sent to my room. What if they didn't bring Cody's sweater? I couldn't leave that behind. But when we reached the two SUVs waiting for us on the drive, it was Taylor who was holding my duffel. His expression was blank, but he gave his head a slight tilt toward my bag. I could trust him to pack what was important. Hook, Nick, and Luke, as well as the others that had watched over me these last few weeks, stood by with varying looks of fury and helplessness on their faces. I wanted to thank them and give them proper goodbyes, but Dad shoved me into the back seat of the vehicle and climbed in after me. The door slammed shut, closing us in. When we reach the chateau, you're going to have a new set of rules, Dad informed me. You can't control me forever, I whispered. On my other side, Mom stiffened. You are a villasaurus. You will do all that is required of you, or there will be dire consequences. Your only role is to be an example of a perfect daughter willing to support her family and do as she's instructed. Our reputation has already begun to suffer because of your actions, being mixed up with those summoners and wraiths, and now words going around that we let our daughter date a talon. Her expression turned sullen. I will not let it fall any more. As if I give two shits about your reputation. She grabbed me by the jaw and forced me to turn and look at her. I sucked in a sharp breath through my nose, sensing my magic rising inside of me. My scars prickled. That will be the first thing we take care of once we arrive. Her grip constricted until my face ached. Perhaps in a few months you'll remember your place and that what we've done is for you. She released me, and I sulked against the seat. Panic at what hell they were going to put me through sent a shiver racing down my spine. I thought of Cody and their threat that I'd never see him again. I would. I had to. I shut my eyes, mentally counting, while I tapped my fingers against my left thigh. When that failed to work, I tried to run through my mantra. Dad suddenly snatched up my left hand, crushing my fingers together. We'll have no more of that, either. You are a villasaurus. Panic attacks are beneath you. I can't just stop them from happening. My voice came out breathy. I tugged on my hand, but he wouldn't let it go. Learn to. I'm tired of you dwelling on the past, on a situation that you created. Dad, please. I begged, the panic causing my chest to become tight. I couldn't get enough air. My vision began to blur, and I couldn't stop the shaking that came next. I pulled harder on my hand, but he refused to let go. Why are you doing this to me? Tears burned in my eyes. Why? He said nothing in reply, and neither did Mom. With no way to settle my mind, I was thrown back into memories of that night at the warehouse. The panic gave way to fear. I thrashed against the seat, needing to get free. Dad's grip turned into one of those manacles holding me to the floor. I screamed, unable to stop the terror from seizing my limbs and driving into that vortex of power inside of me. Dad's angry shout did nothing to help. Then he was telling Mom to give it to me. I had no idea what he was talking about. Then he was forcing my head back, and Mom poured something into my mouth. The liquid tasted vile. I sputtered, trying to spit it out, but she clamped her hand over my mouth and held my nose, forcing me to swallow. When I finally did, she released me, and I sagged forward. A rush of ice shot through my body and straight toward my magic. Before I could understand what was happening to me, 
Mom forced something else down my throat. My eyelids became heavy, and I slumped over. Cody's face appeared in my mind. Then there was nothing. Chapter 8. Cody I leaned on the table in the conference room. We had to be missing something. All I needed was one lead, just one to get me to Remus again. I shoved the stack of papers aside and pushed my hands through my hair. Helpless. That was all I felt right then. Fucking helpless to track down Remus and end this for Megan. Adam stood across the room, muttering to himself while he looked over more papers tacked to a corkboard. We tried magical traces to find Remus's path after he left the club. Nothing. We went back and checked out the remaining locations on that damn list. Nothing. And the summoners we'd brought in from the club had been useless, too. We were back to square one. My cell vibrated in my pocket with an incoming call. I pulled it out and my heart rate shot up the second I saw it was Luke and not Megan. Yeah, I answered. Is Adam with you? he asked. He's here. Why? Adam turned at my words and tilted his head. I shrugged. I want someone to be with you to stop you from losing your shit, he replied. I clutched at my phone. What happened? Megan's parents showed up at Academy, Luke said, his voice clipped. They argued with Hook, then they took her away. She's gone. His words echoed inside my skull, bouncing around like a fucking pinball. Adam and Luke were both saying my name, but I couldn't get myself to respond. The cell phone was taken from my hand. Empty, it fell to my side. Gone. Megan was gone. Her parents had stolen her away. The floor trembled. The walls and the ceiling followed suit. I gritted my teeth and stormed for the door. Adam yelled after me. I kept walking, ready to find the first available vehicle and take off. The council was still in session, meaning they were staying at the same chateau they'd been in for months. I'd start there. I wasn't going to let Megan be tucked away and forced to hide her magic again. That's what her parents would do. I didn't have to ask to know what they planned for her. Once outside, with every step I took, the earth roiled around my feet. Adam grabbed hold of my arm while three talons rushed in to block me from getting into a vehicle. Move. Now. The ground rumbled with my words. Cody, stop and think, Adam told me. You can't just take off to get her back. Why the fuck not? If you go there, they won't just let her leave. You'd have to break her out, and they'd tell everyone on the council that you kidnapped their daughter. You'll be one of the most wanted people in the country. Is that what you want, for you and Meg to be on the run for the rest of your lives? Do you have any idea what they're going to do to her? It won't matter if you don't do this the right way, and you know it. They'll turn everything around on you. Everything. Adam nodded to the talons in front of me. They backed off but remained close. Come back inside, and we'll figure this out. I hung my head. The earth jutted up around me in small, spiked mounds. I hadn't been able to protect Megan from Remus. Now I'd fail to protect her from her parents. A hand gripped my shoulder, and I jerked my head up. Adam stood before me. We're going to find Remus and stop him. Once he's taken care of, I will do whatever is necessary to get Meg back to you. You have my word, Cody. Right now, she's surrounded by guards and in a heavily warded location. It's not ideal, but she's still safe. From Remus, I whispered, but not her parents. What if she lost it while she was with them? Her panic attacks had been less frequent, but being dragged away from Academy and locked up? What would that do to her? I might have a way to get a message to her, Adam told me. Right now, it's the best I can do. How? Taylor, one of her parents' guards, used to be a Talon a long time ago. Reaching out to him will be a risk. But if it stops you from taking off and attacking two council members, we should take it. The ground beneath me settled, and I nodded. Adam handed me my phone and led the way inside. We walked to his office, and he shuffled around for some paper and a pen. Keep it short, he told me. The smaller the paper, the easier it'll be to slip past the wards around the chateau. 
Is that where they took her? Adam looked like he wanted to kick himself for letting that intel slip. I'd already assumed, but the confirmation was good. It had saved me from checking out other places first when I did go find Megan. Yeah, she's at the chateau. She was so close. I curled my hands into fists, but reminded myself why what Adam told me was accurate. If I went to get Megan without a plan, we'd end up in an even worse situation. I needed a plan, one that wouldn't end up with us being chased. I picked up the pen and paper and wrote out the simplest message I could. I folded up the tiny slip and handed it to Adam. Thank you. I'll see this gets to where it needs to go. Get back to the conference room. Use that anger against Remus. He stepped around me and out the door. I hung back a moment longer. Then I did as he said. I stomped to the wall with the images of Remus tacked to it and glowered at each one. I'd find him. Bring him down. Then I'd be going to get Megan. I was going to give her that chance for the future she wanted. No matter what the cost, I'd pay it. She'd suffered enough. I'm coming for you soon, I whispered, wishing Megan could hear me. Just hold on for me. Chapter 9. Meg. It was cold. Why was it so damn cold? My teeth chattered. I curled in on myself, fighting against the chill seeping through my limbs. Confused, I opened my eyes. No, I whispered and shot upright. Every inch of me was stiff. No, no, please, gods, no! The ceiling was high and decorated with crown molding and a fancy gold and crystal chandelier. The walls were painted in a dark olive color. The bed, dresser, and nightstands were in tones of ivory and cream. I'd always hated everything about this room. Now I loathed it even more. This room had been the one I had stayed in at the chateau, the one my parents occupied. It hadn't been a nightmare then. They'd come to academy and taken me away. Bolting off the bed, I raced for the bedroom door. It was locked from the outside. A shimmering layer of magic lay over it, too. I banged my fist against it. Sparks fluttered into the air, and the magic held. You can't keep me in here forever, I shouted through the door. I raised my hand to knock again, but that same icy touch I'd felt in the SUV shot down my spine. My back arched, and the air was driven from my lungs. The swirling vortex of light inside me that was my magic screamed. I fell to my knees and slapped my hands to my ears. Flashbacks of the ride here came to me. My parents, they'd done something to me. The cold ebbed. I fell over onto my hands and knees, staring at the ghastly olive and gold rug. A wall. They'd put a magical wall around my magic. I couldn't reach it, but I could feel it straining to break free. I could feel it raging inside me, churning like a maelstrom of energy with no way out. Each time I tried to summon earth or spirit, they bashed into the wall, sending another rush of ice down my spine that paralyzed me. Tears slipped down my cheeks. The urge to find my parents and beat their heads together was replaced by my heart stuttering and my body feeling as if it was coming apart. My stomach turned over. I waited to be sick. Why? Why would they do this? Did they have any idea what this was going to do to me? How much pain I was in? I stayed on the floor, unsure of how much time had passed. No one came to check on me, no matter how much I ranted. I crawled my way to the door. I hate you! I yelled through it, hoping my parents could hear. I hate you! You're nothing but cowards! I kicked and bashed my fists against the wood. It never budged, and the wards held. Exhaustion crept through my limbs. I slid down the floor and wound up sitting with my back to it. I pulled my knees up to my chest and rested my forehead on them. I was trapped, and my magic had been forced behind a wall. I reached for the charm around my neck, thankful it hadn't been taken away from me, too. Cody, I whispered. He'd lose his mind once he realized I'd been taken, but he'd have no way of knowing how bad the situation was, and I had no way to tell him. I'd never thought my parents would go so far as to put a dampener on my magic, to force it behind a wall, as if that would do anything for me except make me lose it even worse. Because eventually, 
That wall of theirs would break. Already I sensed my magic working against it, searching for a weak spot. I'd have no way to control it once it was unleashed. No way in hell. I tapped my fingers against my thigh and counted to five over and over. I pictured Cody's face and tried to imagine him there with me. It worked to calm the worst of my panic, until another burst of ice gave my spine a jolt. Then I threw my head back and screamed, letting the entire chateau know my pain. Taylor glanced worriedly at the tray of food I'd left untouched on the dresser. Meg, you have to eat at some point. I'm not going to sit here and let you starve yourself. I hugged my arms tighter around myself, snuggling into Cody's sweater. After I'd finally dragged my ass off the floor that first night here, I'd gone through the duffel of things Taylor had packed up for me. Cody's sweater had been right on top. I might not have cared to keep in contact with my parents the whole time I was at Academy. But I'd texted Taylor now and again. He'd been one of the few people I'd mentioned Cody to, and how much my relationship with my once bodyguard meant to me. I had tried over the last two days to reach out to Cody using my spirit energy, but with it trapped behind the magical wall, it was impossible to use any of my magic. Taylor picked up the tray of food and brought it to the nightstand. He sat on the edge of the bed, giving me a concerned look I wish I could have seen on my dad's face one of these days. But that would never happen. He was the bastard who put me in this situation to begin with. Why would he care if it was causing me to be tormented? Why would he care if I was in pain every minute of the day now? That was what he'd wanted, right? No, he wouldn't care. He'd tell me I was being weak and to get over it. Try to eat something, Taylor urged. I can have Cook make you whatever you want. Hell, I'll even bring you a mango smoothie. I can't, I whispered. I glanced at the food on the tray again. There was a soup that was little more than broth and a glass of water. I'd managed to drink some of the water at least, but even looking at the food caused my stomach to churn. How long are they going to keep me like this? Taylor glared at the door. I don't know. Neither of them has been willing to hear me out. It's getting worse. It's only been four days and it's already worse, I confessed. All I see when I close my eyes now are these horrible scenes playing out, of my magic getting out of my control and killing everyone around me. The daytime wasn't any better, though I wasn't sure I should tell Taylor everything. What could he do for me now? Meg? Before I could say anything else, my magic swirled around inside me. For two days, it had done all it could to rush to my defense, knowing I was in distress. Too bad it didn't seem to care that in doing so, it was only causing me more harm. My magic made another attack at the wall, holding it in. When it connected, the searing, ice-cold agony shot down my spine. I curled inward, trying to stop myself from flailing. The scream burst free of my mouth once the screaming inside my soul started and my magic attacked the wall even harder. The prickling along my scars turned into thousands of needles being stabbed deep into my skin. When it was over, I was lying on my side with my head hanging over the edge of the bed. I dry-heaved a few times until my body settled. Taylor crouched beside me, holding my hand. If he scowled any harder, I feared his face would get stuck like that. Gently, he helped me get comfortable again. The shivering came next. He dragged the numerous quilts I'd been using each night up the bed and covered me. Thanks, I said through chattering teeth. He glanced toward the bedroom door, then tilted his head as if he was listening to someone talking to him through the comms in his ear. What is it? I asked. His eyes subtly narrowed. Three seconds later, he sank to the edge of the bed, took my hand in his, and squeezed. I had to wait until your parents left for the day, just in case. In case of what? They sensed magic that wasn't mine. His hand warmed, and the words flowed through my mind. Words that came with the sound of Cody's voice. I'm coming for you. Tears prickled my eyes and hung in my eyelashes. Taylor let go of my hand. But Cody's words stayed with me, sinking into me, as if he was right there beside me, whispering them in my ear. I clung to the dragon charm around my neck. What he'd told me around the holiday came back to me then, too. Dragons fiercely protect what they care for most. If for some reason I'm not right by your side when you need me, you've got something to hold on to until I can get there. 
I squeezed the tiny charm as hard as I could. Hold on, Meg. I could have sworn I heard him say to me, Just hold on. Taylor stayed with me, sitting on the edge of the bed and watching over me with a close eye. I must have dozed off at some point. When I opened my eyes again, Taylor was gone, and night had fallen. Rolling over, I curled up onto my other side and tried to go back to sleep. Megan, my dear, it's been too long. I bolted upright. Remus stood at the foot of my bed. I scrambled away, but the wind lashed out around my ankles, yanking me toward him. It forced my back off the bed, and Remus's hand wrapped around my throat. You and I have unfinished business, he whispered. His grip tightened. I tried to scream. I tried to fight back, loosen his grip, do something. But nothing worked. His hold constricted even more. I dragged my nails down his arms. His cackle surrounded me as the wind gusted around and around, tearing the room apart. My eyes rolled back, and I waited for the end to come. Inside of me, my magic rallied, shrieking their fury. My power pushed toward the surface, straining to be let loose, but the damn wall stopped it. The resulting agony left me blinded, but not deaf to my own screaming. Hands were holding my arms down but that only put pressure on the scars that were already making it feel as if my skin was being sliced open. A nightmare. It was just a nightmare. Taylor? Megan, calm down. Please calm down. I tried. I really did. But my magic was furiously turning into a storm once again. With nowhere to go, it built stronger and moved faster, slamming into that wall until I thought I was going to break in two. This is insane. Mike snapped, standing on the other side of the bed. We have to remove the dampener. Can we? Isaac was there too. What if we try and we make it worse? Worse than this? Mike argued. Fuck, she can't go on like this much longer. Amongst the rest of my parents' guards, these two were the only other ones I trusted almost as much as I trusted Taylor. I opened my mouth to tell them just to do it, but that damn icy touch slithered down my spine. The pain came a second later. I blinked, and the nightmare image of Remus was standing at the foot of the bed again. My power shot forward, ready to defend me. I felt it pushing against the wall, fighting to get free to protect me, to save me. And when it couldn't, its screams became even louder, deafening me to everything else. Taylor, Mike, and Isaac were still talking. I watched their mouths move, but I heard nothing. Tears had fallen from my eyes at some point without me noticing. I couldn't stop shaking. The headboard rattled against the wall from it. I wanted out of here. Running away wouldn't get rid of the pain. The wall. I had to get rid of the dampener placed on me. Closing my eyes, I turned inward. I wanted the wall to break. What happens if it does? Look at yourself. You won't be able to control your power. Fear curled around me in ever-tightening ropes that led straight to a wave of panic I had no hope of fighting off. Breathe. I had to keep breathing. Shit, she's hyperventilating, Isaac uttered. Taylor's face hovered over mine. He started to count, then said the mantra he'd taught me so long ago. I worked on breathing in through my nose and tapping out the count against my left thigh. I couldn't let my magic break free, not like this, not when I was about to lose my mind. I'd destroy the chateau and everyone in it, including me. The counting began to help. It was slow going, but I was able to steady my breathing. Then the bedroom door opened. What's happening in here? We have guests coming by soon. I won't have this screaming taking place while they're here. Mom stomped into view, Dad right beside her. Enough! Back away from her right now! She's having a panic attack, ma'am. Mike came around the other side of the bed, blocking me from my parents' view. Taylor is calming her down. She can't keep going on like this, Isaac added. Panic attacks, Dad scoffed. Our family does not have panic attacks. Stand aside. When none of the men moved, a gust of wind whipped around the room. They were forcibly shoved away from the bed and crashed into the wall. Then Dad was there, hoisting me upright. The abrupt movement set a shock of searing pain through my scars. I screamed, or I tried to. Dad snapped his fingers and the air was stolen from my lungs. I clutched at my throat while my lungs burned. 
he let me get air again, and I sagged forward, sucking in air far too fast. Lightheadedness would have knocked me over, but Dad hadn't let go of my shoulder yet. I've had enough of this nonsense. He grabbed my other shoulder and forced me to turn around and look right at him. Rumors are flying around about why we pulled you out of Academy. None of them are good for you or for us. You will get over these panic attacks. You will remember your place in this family, and you will do as we tell you from this point forward. You will make yourself presentable to return to society by our side. Do I make myself clear? Or what? I spat. Dad jerked back. The wind turned frigid while it blew around me. What more can you do to me? I asked, pushing against the bed and making it unsteadily to my feet. Do you have any idea what's happening to me right now? Any at all? It's no less than what you deserve for what you've done to us, he replied. We've done everything we could these years to make you understand how important it is for you to keep the secret of what you are, to keep you safe, to guarantee our legacy continues. And all you've done is spit in our faces. A legacy of what? A bunch of cowards? I yelled, spreading my arms wide. You've never let me do anything with my magic, ever. Is that going to change? Is it? And you too. You can hardly use one element, let alone all of them. Do you have any idea what I'm capable of? You should see what I can do, how incredible my magic is, and you don't care. You'd rather destroy it and me than let me be a true Villasaurus. I held his glare while I added, one that can actually use all of my magic. His jaw clenched and his eyes narrowed. I've seen what happens when you use it all. You leave blood and death in your wake. I flinched away from his words, which were almost as harsh as a slap to the face. You've done nothing to show that you're ready for that level of responsibility. All you've ever done is cause trouble. Everything that's happened to you, that you're suffering now, that's the consequences of your actions. He turned sharply on his heel and stomped back toward Mom. My actions? I repeated, and Dad stopped short. Are you fucking kidding me? He turned around, but there wasn't a chance for him to say anything else. My power took that chance to bash into the wall again, catching me off guard. I stumbled and doubled over. Taylor reached out for me, but Dad pushed him and the others back with another gust of icy wind. I hit my knees, struggling not to scream. Not in front of them. I dragged my nails across the rug while tears streamed down my cheeks. Out, Dad ordered, all of you, and I don't want to see you in here again. Taylor, Mike, and Isaac didn't move. But them getting in trouble because of me was the last thing I wanted. As hard as it was, I raised my head and gave Taylor a nod, silently telling him to go. He shook his head at my parents, then marched out of the room, the others right behind him. My parents turned to follow. I forced out a laugh, and they paused a few feet from the threshold. You'll regret this, I rasped through the pain. You have no idea what you're doing to me. None. Do you honestly believe this dampener will keep my magic in check forever? Mom's face paled a hint, but Dad's became redder while he stared down at me. My magic is like this because of you. I was starting to control it, to make it part of me. Then you did this to me. You shoved it back in a cage. What do you think will happen once it breaks free, huh? Do you think you'll be safe? Is that a threat? Dad asked. It's a warning. You forget. You came from us. Whatever you believe you can do, you will never be stronger than us. He said it, but behind his rage, I spotted the tiniest flicker of uncertainty. Think about what you've done, and perhaps in a few months, we'll remove the dampener. It won't last that long. We'll just have to see. He nudged Mom toward the door, telling her, Add another layer of wards. We don't need our guests hearing this racket. Driven purely by the desire to get out of here, I charged them and the door, ready to tackle them to the floor if it'd give me a chance to get out. Dad spun, and a gale threw me across the room. I bashed into the wall and slid to the floor in a heap. The door slammed shut and another layer of shimmering wards appeared over it. No, I whispered, pushing myself up off the floor. No, don't. Ah! I fell back to the floor, 
shivering and shaking from the cold and pain ravaging me. I curled into the smallest ball I could, muffling my screams against the rug. I wasn't going to make it out of here. And at this rate, neither would anyone else. Chapter 10. Cody. A week. It had been over a fucking week since Megan had been taken from Academy. Over a week since I'd been able to talk to her. I had no idea what she was going through. No idea if she was all right. I was quickly losing the control I'd spent years working on. Each day that passed without a word from her, another part of me broke apart. Not having any new leads on Remus wasn't helping. I needed him off the board so I could go to Megan. I was trapped. I bashed my fist onto the table, denting the metal. Adam stepped into the room and stood on the other side of it while I examined the damage. Sorry, I muttered, without raising my head to look at him. When he remained silent, I straightened. Adam? His brow was deeply furrowed. It was then I felt the subtle breeze flowing through the room, making the papers pinned to the boards on the walls flutter as well as those on the table. He cursed under his breath, and the breeze turned into a vicious gust that sent papers flying every which way. What happened? I asked. Adam pinched the bridge of his nose. I'd planned on coming here with good news for you, but I'm afraid that's not happening today. It's probably not happening in the next week either. Another rush of air swept through the room. I've been fighting to get someone over to the Wright's Chateau to check on Megan. You heard something, didn't you, from Taylor? I whispered, my voice taut. What was it? At his hesitation, the earth beneath us trembled, causing the rest of the room to shake. Adam, tell me. The day they took her away, they placed a magical dampener on her power. She's been locked in her room at the Chateau this entire time from what Taylor's reported. It's not good. The room shook harder. They'd caged her magic after she'd worked so hard to find a way to understand and work with it. Her parents forced it into a cage. What was that doing to her? She wasn't merely a prisoner in her own home now. She was being tortured by the people who were meant to protect her, meant to care for her. As far as the council is concerned, seeing as they've been to the Wright's Chateau a few times, there's nothing occurring out of the ordinary. And as they've told me several times now, I have no proof that she's being harmed. I've told them my intel is coming from inside the home. They apparently questioned all the staff under the Wright's employ, and they claim the information I'm giving the council is false. I don't know what the fuck is happening there, but they all seem to believe I'm ranting about nothing. Her parents claim Megan is simply under the weather and is recovering. They even have pictures of Megan smiling. What? I snapped. They're faked. I have no doubts about that. Adam planted his hands on his hips and glared at the far wall. There's nothing else I can do at this point, aside from going there and kidnapping her. I perked up at the tone in his voice. Are you saying that's an option now? I'm saying after what I just heard from Taylor, yeah, it's an option. And I know just the talons to do it, too. But if we do this with Remus still on the loose, it complicates matters. We could bring her here, but it'd be best if we took her to a safe house, hid her away somewhere. Then we do it. General Pierce, Adam, I said, walking around the table to him. I can't leave her there another day if she's suffering like this. I can't. He was already reaching for his cell phone. I'll make a... General Pierce? Another Talon rushed into the conference room, a piece of paper clutched in her hand. Sir, there's been activity at the warehouse. That one connected to Gorgothus? What? When? Adam demanded. Five minutes ago, magic traces set off the wards you left behind, same ones matching that of this Gorgothus guy. Adam read the paper she'd given him, then looked to me. He's there. Figured the second Megan needed me that Remus would finally show his face. We get Remus, Adam said. Then we get Megan and take her somewhere safe. It'll be one less threat against her life once we break her out of that damn place. Let's go get this asshole, I whispered, and followed Adam and the other Talon out the door. He's the only one inside, Adam reported through the comms in my ear. This feels off. I peered around the old metal drums I was crouched behind. 
the warehouse that Megan had been brought to three years ago had certainly seen better days. The damage it had sustained during the incident remained. None of the windows remained intact. The only set of wide double sliding doors no longer opened or shut, but had been melted into the corrugated metal walls. The concrete around the entire structure was blackened and charred. When Adam and I first came here during our initial hunt for any leads on Remus, it wasn't the damage to the outside of the building that had left me speechless. It had been what had remained on the inside. What had once been catwalks had been twisted and melted together in a myriad of strange shapes. They hung from the rafters, waiting to break free and crash to the floor below. The walls were covered in burn marks. The metal appeared to drip like paint in some places. Worse had been the metal eye loops that had been driven into the middle of the floor, and lying beside them, little more than clumps of steel, were the chains and manacles that once held Megan trapped in this place. I wanted to bring it to the ground. Adam had convinced me to leave it standing. The chances were slim, he told me that day, but he'd wondered if Remus wouldn't try to come back here for one reason or another. He'd set up wards as alarms, and we'd left the warehouse exactly as we'd found it. Now, as much as I wanted to rush in there and beat the man to a pulp before dragging him off to rot in a cell, the uneasiness churning in my gut said to wait. What are you picking up? Adam asked. I'm not sure. Why would he come here? There's nothing in that warehouse. We checked it out ourselves. And alone? We'd arrived with plenty of backup in tow. Once we'd surrounded the place, a handful of us had moved in to scope it out. I kept waiting for others to show up. If Remus was planning something that had to do with the Villasaris family, it'd be impossible for him to pull it off alone. Even he wasn't strong enough to take on that many summoners alone. Another thirty seconds went by, and I stood up. I'm going to check it out. Keep everyone else back. Not giving Adam a chance to argue with me, I started toward the warehouse. He muttered through the comms, but didn't yell at me to stop. I eased my way forward. The sky had darkened on our drive over here. Now thunder rumbled, while lightning began to flash to the south. The air smelled of rain. A storm was coming. I couldn't help but think of it as a bad omen. A few drops of rain pattered against the ground. The gentle spattering turned into a steady drizzle, soaking my hair and shirt. Keeping the doors in sight, I worked my way to the side of the warehouse and pressed my back to the wall. Cautiously, I peered around the edge of the melted door. Inside, there was hardly enough light to make out anything other than a sole figure standing in the middle of the space, right where those chains rested. Remus stood perfectly still. Too still. I stepped over the threshold. A jolt of energy that made me grit my teeth shot upward through my foot. A gust of wind howled out of the warehouse, wrapped around me, and yanked me in. Not about to be caught off guard a second time, I let the wind twist me around and focused instead on the earth beneath the warehouse floor. The entire building groaned. Shards of metal crashed around me, a few nearly slicing into my legs while the wind continued to throw me around while dragging me closer to Remus. Three pillars of rock and dirt burst out of the concrete slab. They moved like a wave circling and closing in on Remus. I brought my hands together, and the rock created a cage around him, blocking him from view. The gusting winds disappeared. I threw out my hand quickly enough to bring a rush of rock surging up to catch me, softening my fall. My boots hit the ground, and I stomped toward the bastard, now trapped in the center of the warehouse. With a jerk of my head, I made the earthen prison part enough for me to peer inside. Fuck! My stomach dropped and I hurriedly backed away. He wasn't in there. Where the hell had he gone? Or he'd never been here at all. Gods, how could I have been so stupid? Pressing my finger to my ear, I called out to Adam. It's a trap. He's not here. What? Static filled the comms. Cody, get... just run! I spun around, ready to race for the exit, but what I realized now was merely an illusion of Remus had reappeared right in front of me. His lips pulled back in a jeer while his eyes glimmered with malice. Don't worry about Megan. She won't suffer without you for long. 
Remus's voice spoke through the illusion's mouth that didn't even open. I'll tell her you said goodbye. I lunged for the illusion. It evaporated out of my hands. Cody! Adam's shout no longer came through the comms. He stood on the other side of the warehouse doorway, waving at me to get moving. Waves of energy began to ripple through the air, pulsing faster and faster with each passing second. The walls trembled. The wind howled as if a tornado was about to be dropped on this place. Head down, I sprinted for the exit. A few feet away, the howling became deafening. It felt as if the air was being sucked out of my lungs. Then it came back with a vengeance. The blast threw me from the warehouse, as well as anyone else who'd been standing too close. I slammed into the ground, wondering if I'd broken any bones. Dazed from the hit, it took me a few seconds to recover enough to look over my shoulder. The storm outside was still approaching at a fast clip. The drizzle had turned into a downpour, leaving puddles here and there. Inside the warehouse, the tornado continued to churn, tearing the building down piece by piece. Eventually, the spell ran its course. With one final creak of protest, the metal ceiling collapsed, and the walls soon followed. Don't worry about Megan. She won't suffer without you for long. Meg! I rasped. Grimacing against the aches and pains, I got to my feet, then stumbled over to Adam. He was doubled over. Blood covered the side of his head, but otherwise he appeared unharmed. Trap! It was a trap! He's going after Meg! Adam straightened in an instant and shouted orders for everyone to load up and pull out. I followed him to the SUV. He tossed me his phone and told me to try and get a hold of Taylor at the chateau. I called, but it went straight to voicemail. I ran through every number he told me to try. None of them worked. I dropped his phone in the center console and glared out the windshield. Adam pressed his foot to the floorboard. We sped toward the chateau, while I prayed we weren't too late. Chapter 11. Meg. One, two, three, four, five. I frantically tapped out the count on my thigh. How long had I been doing it? Ten minutes? An hour? I scrunched my eyes shut even tighter, repeating the numbers again and again and again. My mantra had stopped working days ago. The walls of this damn room kept closing in on me. I couldn't be here any longer. I couldn't. Why had they done this to me? I was cold, so damn cold. The aching in my limbs felt permanent now. When was the last time I'd eaten anything or moved? I'd been sitting in the corner, curled in on myself as tight as I could get. It was the only way I felt safe. The walls? I pretended the walls were Cody's arms. It was a sad excuse for him, more than sad. But I had nothing else. Picturing his face was hard now. I shoved my hand through my hair and clutched at my head. I turned inward, searching for that swirling vortex of light. It was there. I knew it was. But that fucking dampener placed on me wouldn't let me reach it. My magic cried out for me, begging to be released. It pushed against the magical barricade again. My back spasmed. I gritted my teeth against the sensation of something moving beneath my skin, of it twisting and churning inside of my soul. Every damn scar on my body lit up in stabbing pain. Anywhere my clothing touched them only made it worse. There on the floor, I twitched to try and get away. But there was no escape. There was no getting out of this hell my parents dumped me in. Cody, I whispered, holding on to his name. He'll come for me. He said he would. He'll get me out of here. He'll save me. My pained whimper turned into a scream. My magic had bashed into the barricade, furious to be held in check like this after finally sensing freedom. A second wave of mind-numbing agony hit me. Somehow I wound up on my back, staring up at the ceiling. My throat felt raw, as if I'd been screaming for hours. A tear slipped from my eye and was soaked up by my hair. Cody. I thought of him, shut my eyes, and tried to keep counting. I found the dragon charm around my neck and grasped it tightly. It was all I had left to hold on to. Images of Cody and me floated through my mind in a peaceful, endless stream. 
the rich tone of his voice, surrounded my mind and eased the prickling of my scars. My back began to grow stiff from the hard floor, but I couldn't get myself to move. What was the point? A door opened with a loud creak, and footsteps rushed toward me. Meg? Shit. Come on, let's get you up off the floor. Hands took a firm hold on my upper arms, dragging me into a sitting position. Every inch of me hurt. I grimaced each time I was made to move. I know, the voice said roughly. We're getting you out of here. Cody? I willed my eyes to open, waiting to see his familiar brown eyes. After a moment of blinking furiously, the blurriness cleared. A face came into view. Taylor? What are you doing here? You can't. They'll hurt you, too. I don't give a damn what they do to me. Can you stand up? He asked. I think so. With him holding onto my arms, he managed to lift me off the floor and got me to my feet. My legs wobbled, but he didn't let me slump back down to the floor. He had my coat in his hands and was wearing one himself. What are you doing? I whispered. What the fuck do you think? Your parents went too far this time. I'm getting you out of here and I'm taking you to Cody. He and General Pierce will find a way to protect you from your parents. He glanced over his shoulder. We don't have much time. You can't do this. They won't let it go if you help me. I should have done this years ago. I shouldn't have let them treat you as they did after what you went through. He helped me put on the coat, then stood in front of me. His face was drawn, and I could have sworn there were more gray hairs on his head now. I'm sorry, Megan. I failed you all this time. I won't fail you again. I gripped his hand. Thank you. He nodded, then held onto my hand and guided me toward the bedroom door. Mike and Isaac were on lookout. Your parents are gone at a banquet for the council. He peered around the doorframe, left and right, then glanced down at me. While we stood there, my magic swirled around faster and faster, as if realizing what was happening. Not now. I couldn't lose it right now. But there was no stopping it from screaming its fury and bashing into the barricade again. I slammed a hand into my chest, biting back the scream that wanted so badly to fall from my mouth. I clapped my hand over my lips. Tears streamed down my cheeks. Not wanting to hurt Taylor, I tried to pry my hand loose from his. He merely held on tighter. My scars were on fire. By the time the fit passed, my vision was filled with black spots, and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to walk. Taylor wrapped his arm around my shoulders, held me tightly to his side, and we exited the bedroom. With how dark it was, I assumed it was night. I hadn't bothered opening the shutters in the bedroom for the last week. What was the point? I hadn't wanted to see what I wasn't able to reach. At the end of the corridor, Taylor paused a second time. Faintly, I thought I heard someone else talking and realized he had a calm in his ear. Almost there, Taylor whispered to me once we were moving again. Almost. How I stayed upright and navigated the stairs? I'll never know. The promise of seeing Cody again was probably what did it. The front doors I hadn't seen since the day I was brought here came into view. A single light was on in the entryway. Taylor picked up the pace. The door opened, and a rush of cold air burst inside. I welcomed it, letting it ground me and remind me this was real. Taylor was over the threshold. Just as I took a step to join him, the ground trembled beneath my feet. A gust of wind brushed against my back, then wrapped around me and yanked me away from Taylor and back inside the chateau. The wind dropped me to the floor. I smacked into it hard, barely catching myself in time to stop from getting a broken nose. What do you think you're doing with our daughter? Mom yelled. Fire crackled in Taylor's hands. Getting her away from you. Steps came up behind me. Then I was yanked to my feet. Sharp nails dug into my arm, even through the coat and Cody's sweater I was still wearing. Mom dragged me back further into the chateau. Dad was at her side, as well as six of their guards. Two stepped out of another doorway to the right of the entry and flanked Taylor, Mike, and Isaac. You are breaking your blood oaths, Dad warned them, a gust of frigid air whipping through the house at his words. You will be locked away for this treachery. 
You and your wife are the criminals here, Taylor yelled. Don't you see what you're doing to your daughter? Your daughter, William. I'm teaching her a lesson and keeping her safe. You're killing her, Taylor argued. What is wrong with both of you? And where were you going to take her? Mom demanded. To the one she should be with. Mom scoffed. That Aether's man, is that it? You were going to take her to him? He's nothing to our family. He's nothing but a broken, useless waste of space. He never should have been allowed to become a Talon, let alone get close to our daughter. He seduced her. He's the reason she's like this, rebelling against us, causing us trouble all over again. Shut up, I whispered. What did you say to me? I turned and glared at my mother. I said, shut up. You don't get to talk about him. The ground quaked beneath us. I will not hear another word about him from you. Not another word. You will never see him again, ever. If you're lucky, you might be able to become part of a civilized society in a few years, if you learn your place in it. They were going to lock me up somewhere else. Somewhere worse. And Cody? He'd never be able to find me. Would they try to hurt him? Get him locked up? They'd already made everyone believe he was involved in the summoner's attack and the wraiths. I jerked on my arm, but Mom's grip was too strong. Let me go. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be part of this family. That, I'm afraid, is not your choice. I flung curses at Mom, screaming at her while I fought against her hand. My magic slammed into that barricade again and again, frantic to answer my silent call for it to attack. When my scars prickled, a voice in the back of my head said I was going to lose control. I had to stop. But a crack had formed in the barricade. Feeling it, my magic reared back and attacked that weak spot. I had no idea if I'd be able to keep my power in check once it was unleashed, but I had to get out of there. I wouldn't be locked away again. I wouldn't survive it. Enough, Megan, Mom yelled, while Dad continued to argue with Taylor. Stop fighting me! Why? You don't even care about me. You never have. Taylor's right. You're killing me, Mom! I shouted, and her eyes went wide, then narrowed. You're killing your daughter. Is that what you want? Is it? She raised her hand. I waited for the slap. Warning yells came from outside. A second later, a massive ball of fire hurtled toward the chateau. Red and orange flames exploded, knocking me off my feet. I slammed into the stairs with Mom at my side. We rolled down them to the main floor. Ears ringing, I raised my head, trying to see. A second fireball struck the chateau, creating a hole where the front entry had been. Up. I had to get up. I had to move. I placed hands beneath me, but my arms shook and gave out. Figures rushed in through the haze of thick black smoke. Figures in black robes. We only need those three. A woman's voice rang out, sounding further away than it was, thanks to the blast messing with my hearing. Leave the others. Hands grabbed for me. My scream came out as a croak instead. I fought against my captors, but I was too damned weak. The dampener around my magic had started to break, but not enough. Memories of the warehouse and what had happened the last time these assholes had taken me consumed my mind. I fought harder, shouting at them to let me go before it was too late. Then someone backhanded me hard enough to see stars. A second hit struck me in the gut, doubling me over. Then I was hoisted up over someone's shoulder and carried out of the ruined chateau. I was cold. That was the first sensation to hit me while I dragged myself out of the darkness. I hadn't remembered passing out. I hadn't even remembered being put in a vehicle. The icy touch of the hard floor beneath me seeped into my bones. My teeth chattered and I shivered. Someone had taken my coat away. I moved, and the clinking of metal sounded. The weight around my wrists hit me then. No, please, gods, no. I vaulted into a sitting position, yanking on the chains that were bolted to the floor. The only light came from a circle of standing torches and candles that covered every available surface. Near the wall of windows, a stone table sat. Perched atop it was a glowing, pointed pillar of some kind of glistening, dark, amber crystal. 
It was at least two feet tall. Magic seeped from it, strong enough to create a faint pulsing around me. Thankfully, though, this place wasn't the warehouse. At one point, it looked like it had been a dining hall of some kind. It was square and nearly as large as the one at Academy. The windows were blocked out, and the furniture lay in a rubbish heap in the corner. The stone walls were covered in layers of dust. I turned, and a few yards away from me, propped up in tall back chairs, were my parents. Chains bound them in place, and they were gagged. Their eyes were wide open and filled with panic. I lunged forward to reach them, but the manacles dug into my wrists. The chains weren't long enough for me to even stand up. Why weren't my parents using their magic? Why weren't they trying to get free? Stomping footsteps approached the room. One by one, figures clad in black robes with hoods covering their faces entered, taking up their places around the perimeter of the room. A final figure stepped through the doorway. My stomach plummeted, and my heart pounded violently against my ribs. Remus, I breathed. His eyes, alight with the same madness I recalled from three years ago, landed on me. Megan, so nice of you to be awake from my arrival. Inside of me, my power coiled like a snake, waiting for its time to strike. But despite the cracks, that damn dampener placed on me by my parents remained. I was useless. Remus walked over to my parents. He grinned while they struggled against the chains and tried to yell at them through their gags. You know, from the stories, I honestly believe the great Lucy and William Villasaurus would have been harder to capture. Curious as to why they are so weak, and you are not. Just let them go, I told Remus. Remember what happened the last time you kidnapped me? The fires guttered around the room. For a few horrible seconds, I couldn't breathe. Then a rush of wind ripped through the hall, knocking me over and pressing me onto the floor. I struggled to get back up, but the wind, howling in my ear, remained an unyielding force against my back. I remember. Remus's voice added pressure to the wind. I cringed at being forced against the hard stone. I remember barely surviving from wounds caused by your magic. I remember my sister's screams while your magic tore her apart. I remember realizing that I was the last of my family because you slaughtered them all. I'm not the monster here, Megan. You are. I didn't want to kill them, I whispered. I tried to warn them. It doesn't matter. They're dead, and you survived. That's how it's always been with your family. The air pressing against my back lifted, and I sucked in a full breath. My relief was short-lived. Remus grabbed a handful of my hair and yanked my head back. It's far past time you and your kin pay the price for all the blood that's been shed for the sake of your name. He yanked harder. I cringed, and my power bashed into that wall even harder. Remus released my hair and backhanded me. Blood filled my mouth. A second hit knocked me over to my side. I must thank your parents for placing a dampener on your magic. Remus stepped over me and returned to their sides. Though at the time I had been looking forward to this being more of a challenge. It's sort of a letdown to have you finally before me and so weak. But it won't matter. Soon enough your power will be mine, and the Villasaurus family will cease to exist. Don't worry. The process will be beyond excruciating. I'll start with your parents. Having you watch them succumb to death slowly will be well worth it. He ran his finger down my mom's cheek, then strode for the door. He gave the orders for the others to start preparations. All the robed figures, save for two, exited the room. How much time did we have until Remus started this mad plan of his? How long until we were dead? I stared at my parents, waiting for them to react, to fight, to do something. Neither of them did more than sit there, cowering in their chairs. Neither of them was strong enough to save our lives. And the one chance I had to get us out of here was trapped behind a magical barrier they'd put in place. They'd killed us. 
Staying on the floor, I shut my eyes and turned inward. Another spasm shot through me. My scars burned. I scraped my nails across the stones until my fingertips were bloody. I had no choice now. I had to break that wall. I had to get us out of here. Whatever happened once my power was unleashed, I had no way of knowing. Before I completely focused on my magic and its voices screaming inside my head, I thought of Cody. I'd been working on communicating with him using spirit summoning, but now with the dampener and my magic this chaotic, I couldn't bring myself to try. Instead, I prayed he'd stay away. I prayed he wouldn't be the one to find my dead body when this all went to shit. I survived my magic erupting once. I wasn't sure I could do it again. I love you, I whispered in my mind while I thought of him. I wished I could have said those words to his face one more time. But it was too late. My magic was preparing to attack that magical barrier again. Back at the chateau, fear of letting it out pushed me to fight against it. Now, I gave myself over to it. The storm of energies threw itself against the wall. I wound up on my back, my muscles tensing until they cramped. My back arched off the floor, and a scream spilled from my mouth, bouncing off the walls. There was a tiny lull of respite, long enough for me to see that the crack had widened. Then the guards were yelling at me, and more figures were running into the room. I turned inward once again, reaching for my magic, and rode the next wave of agony when it struck. Chapter 12 Cody Black smoke blocked out the dawn. The chateau where Megan's family was staying was nothing but a burned-out shell. I was already opening the car door before Adam had even brought the vehicle to a stop. Meg! I sprinted toward the chateau, my heart in my throat. Meg! Damn it! Answer me! Megan! She's... she's not here. I jerked to my right. A man was lying there on what remained of the charred lawn, bearing burns across his entire body. The talons who'd gotten here before us had already put him on a stretcher, and it appeared someone had begun to use water summoning to soothe his wounds. I went to the man and crouched beside him. Who are you? What happened here? Mike. I was one of their guards, but Taylor, him, me, and Isaac? We were trying to get Meg out of this place, he whispered, struggling to keep his eyes open. Her parents? What they did to her? It was making her go insane. It was going to kill her. The earth rumbled beneath me. Tell me. The dampener on her magic trapped her magic inside her. She was in so much pain, Mike grimaced, and I worried he was going to pass out before I'd get the answers I needed. We were almost out. We were going to take her to you, but her parents found out, and they tried to take her back. Then they showed up. Black robes. They blew up the damn chateau. By the time I came around, Meg and her parents were gone. I'm sorry, man. He fell back to the stretcher, and his head lolled on his shoulder. A talon healer ran over to check on Mike. He told me they had to get him to the nearest outpost, and I backed off to give them room. Through what had once been a front door were blackened frames of walls and what remained of a grand staircase. Several bodies, little more than scorched piles of bones, were there, too. One other man appeared to be alive. Everyone else had died during the attack. Adam rushed up to where I stood in the entryway. Taylor, the other guard that lived, said he's damn sure it was the same people who kidnapped Megan last time. Where the fuck did they take her? The stones within what remained of the house quivered. Sparks sputtered from the rubble, igniting what was left of the furniture inside. Megan was gone. I couldn't be too late. Shit, I knew her parents were going to keep her locked up, but to trap her magic? To force it to remain caged? How could they have willingly put her through that torment? It was worse than what Adam told me. Far worse. Would she be able to come back from the brink of insanity? Or would I have to watch another person I loved succumb to madness? He said she was going insane. I uttered to Adam. She was losing it. And now she's been captured by Remus. Adam, if we don't find her fast enough... I've already called in my best trackers. We'll find her. Hold on, Meg. Just hold on for me. I'm coming for you. I swear I am. 
I should have come sooner. I should have just shown up and taken her away from here the second Luke had called me with news. A shout erupted from my mouth, and I bashed my fist into the wall. It collapsed inward, and my magic rippled over the rest of it. Adam yelled a warning, and the few of us who were close enough to be injured by the fallout sprinted out of the way. There in the embers and ashes, I sank to my knees and fell forward onto my hands. What torture would Remus put her through this time? If she was pushed too far like last time, would she survive it? Gods, and if she murdered her captors again, I wasn't sure if she'd be able to live with the guilt. Before she'd been pushed to the edge of sanity, she would have been able to control her magic without question. Now, I had no idea what would happen if that dampener was lifted and her power let loose. I buried my fingers in the ashes. Fear of what I would find once we did track her down twisted my gut. I swallowed down the urge to be sick. Cody, Cody, I'm sorry. Meg? I sat up and looked around. I'd heard her voice. I knew I had. Sharp, stabbing pain struck my temples. I grabbed my head and doubled over while my mind was assaulted by a flood of images. It felt as if something was driving into my back, trying to crush me against a hard surface. The next second, my scalp was on fire. The strike to my face came next, and I tasted blood on my tongue. And all the while, those images continued to bombard me one after the other. Cody, stay away. Just please stay away. Cody, I love you. The images cut off. I gasped and toppled to the side. Adam and another Talon were crouched on either side of me, holding me up. Cody, what the hell was that? Adam snapped and squeezed my shoulder. Cody? Meg. Meg, I blurted out. It was Meg. She reached out to you? Bry's been teaching her. Fuck. I pinched the bridge of my nose, waiting for the dizziness to abate. I felt her. Remus was hurting her, and I saw... No, he's there. He went back there. Went back where? The Gorgrithus mansion. That's where they are, I told Adam in a rush. We have to go, now. The mansion wasn't far from here. We had time. We still had time. Adam shouted more orders for the Talons to gather on the outskirts of the old Gorgrithus estate. We jumped into the SUV, and he sped down the drive, away from the chateau and the grisly scene left behind. Are you still connected to Meg? Adam asked while he floored it onto the main highway. Cars honked, but he paid no attention to them. Nothing. She told me not to come. An ache started in my chest. I flattened my hand to my sternum, thinking of Megan and only her, waiting to feel a spark of that connection again. But there was nothing inside of me other than a strange hollowness. We'd left the vehicles a mile away from the Gorgathus estate. The thunderstorm had followed us here, it seemed. Rain poured down while thunder boomed overhead. Lightning flashed, lighting up the sky as well as the line of talons preparing to lay siege to the estate. We'd stopped at the edge of the trees. A few yards beyond that point, the grounds were covered in glowing red sigils. The moment we triggered those, whatever small army Remus had at his beck and call would know we were here. From inside the mansion, candlelight flickered. Figures moved in front of the windows to what I thought was the dining hall. It was impossible to discern how many. Rain dripped down my back. My clothes were drenched. Thankfully, my summoning wouldn't be affected by the storm. To my right, Talon stepped aside. Then the Pierce brothers were there. Nick and Luke nodded to me. Adam had his gaze fixed on the mansion. There is no easy way in, he informed me. Does anyone have eyes on Meg? I asked. No, but from what we can tell, the only room with people is the front entry and the hall. Breaking those sigils will take time, Luke chimed in, and it's going to have to be delicate if we don't want them to know we're here yet. Get to work on them, Adam ordered. Make sure the spirit summoners are in place to cover us, just in case shit goes sideways. Luke took off with Nick and Adam glanced my way. Are you going to be able to handle this? If you think for a second you're going to order me away from here, I wouldn't dream of it, he interrupted. But I can't have you running there without a damn plan, either. 
Meg will not be happy if she comes out of this to find you died because you were an impatient idiot. I won't, I said. But I knew it was a lie. Adam grunted, obviously sensing how ingenuine I was, but he let it go. We stood there in the rain, waiting for the all-clear for the summoners on whether they were able to break the sigils guarding the grounds. Minutes went by, each one ticking like a damn gong inside my head. All the while, I strained to feel a hint of Megan reaching out to me again. There was nothing. It was quiet. The hollowness I'd felt in my chest on our way here worsened. After twenty or so endless minutes, Adam finally got the word that the wards had been removed without setting off a single one. He gave the silent order for the Talons to advance on the estate. We moved in, keeping the place surrounded. No one was escaping tonight. Already I felt the ground rumbling while the other Earth summoners created traps to catch any of Remus's people trying to flee once the fighting broke out. The water summoners were working with the rain, using it to shield the others. There were only a handful of those who could use spirit here. They already had defenses in place. With Adam and his brothers at my sides, we inched our way forward, one slow, muddy step at a time. The gravel drive had been washed out by the storm. The front doors I'd passed through once before were closed. No one might have stood guard outside, but I could almost guarantee there was someone on the inside. The same prickling of magic I'd felt at the bookstore hit me. I threw my arm out, halting our progress. Adam nodded at me, sensing it too. The entire mansion was magically warded too. I couldn't wait around another twenty minutes. Not while Megan was trapped inside that place with Remus. Adam was already passing along the order to begin dismantling the wards. The screams came seconds after. Megan's screams. The sound shattered my heart and rattled me all the way to my bones. She was in agony. A strange burst of orange light erupted from the side of the mansion. The magic already permeating the air from the wards was joined by another, stronger kind that left a bitter taste in my mouth. Megan's scream became a shriek. Cody, Adam was saying, but it was too damn late. Power roared to life inside my soul, aching for a way out. For too long I'd forced myself to remain in control. No more. Hands flexed and palms facing the ground, I unleashed a swell of magic into the earth. The resounding grumbling drowned out the raging thunder. The foundation of the mansion trembled. My magic bashed into the wards, setting them alight all along the structure. The night became lit up with a red glow. Shouts came from inside the mansion, as did another scream from Megan. Driven by my need to reach her, I pulled on even more magic and redirected it to attack the wards. The stones buckled and heaved, fighting to come to my call, despite the power creating a barrier between us. The red glow brightened, becoming nearly blinding. Remus's magic pushed against mine. Gritting my teeth, I sucked in a breath, then let out a furious bellow that bordered on a roar. Another flood of magic poured out of me and smashed into the ground, cracking it as if there was an earthquake threatening to tear apart the estate. The wards cracked up the side of the mansion, then shattered entirely. The walls beneath buckled, threatening to come apart. Remembering that Megan was inside, I quickly worked to keep them supported. Instead of feeling drained, a new burst of energy seeped through my veins. The front doors opened, and the first of Remus's people charged out into the night. I flicked my wrist. The ground opened up, creating a trench. The first four cloaked figures fell straight into it. I jumped over it and charged into the house. More of Remus's bastards came at me. I dodged most of their attacks, while the Pierce brothers, who'd followed me inside, kept them off me. From the shouts erupting all around me, the rest of the talents had rushed into the mansion from all sides. Megan. I had to get to Megan. I charged down the crumbling hallway, the ground quaking with every step I took. An arched doorway was dead ahead. Through it, the candlelight I'd seen from outside poured through the opening. Brilliant random flashes of amber light erupted while that bitter-tasting magic pulsed through the air. And with each one... Megan's scream worsened. Her voice became hoarse. Chains rattled, and she was pleading for it to stop. 
I stomped into the doorway, noting the other figures in the room. Four cloaked figures stood guard, one in each corner. To my right were two tall-backed chairs. Lucy and William Wright occupied those. Bound in chains and gagged. Both stared wide-eyed and pale at the scene taking place before them. A pained whimper pulled my attention to the center of the room, near the rear wall of windows. Megan lay on her side, hands bound in manacles. In front of her, with his back to me and his arms spread wide, was Remus. A cloak was discarded on the floor nearby. He was shirtless. His body was covered in a myriad of tattoos that pulsed the same amber glow that came from a crystal atop the stone table he stood before. Meg, I breathed, seething all over again. She raised her head a few inches. Her eyes met mine and widened. Cody, no, wait! I stepped forward, and a burning hot pain shot up my legs. The explosion of energy I'd had seconds ago was sapped. Symbols I hadn't noticed on the floor glowed around me. Amber light floated around my legs like fog. The crystal on the table pulsed. This time, beneath the pain, I felt the tug on my magic. Felt it being stolen from me, little by little. What the hell was this? Wildly, I glanced around. Lucy and William were positioned so they, too, were on the symbols leeching their magic. And Megan, she was right at the center of the jaggedly drawn design. Adam's yell came for me, but the doorway that had been opened became blocked by a wall of solid red wards. I couldn't even see through to the other side. The same appeared on the open windows, sealing us inside the room. I took a step toward Megan, determined to reach her side, but the drain on my body was too damn strong. I fell to my knees, wincing from them hitting the stones. I stretched out my hand for Megan. She pushed herself up, shaking from the effort. Her face was so pale, and her eyes hardly held any hope of getting out of here alive. The parts of her scars that were visible were an angry shade of red. She held out a shaky hand toward me, but we were too far apart to touch. The crystal pulsed. The symbols around Megan burned with new energy. That same fog that surrounded me condensed around her, pressing in on her body. Her arms gave out, and she fell to the floor. Moments after, a flicker of gold light shimmered in her eyes. Then it faded, and she curled in on herself with a scream. I pushed forward, crawling to get to her side and make this all stop. Remus spun around, clicking his tongue. He stepped over Megan's writhing form. Once he was in front of me, I lashed out, or tried to. Too much of my strength had been drained. He knocked my arm to the side, then latched his hand around my throat. He leaned over me, his eyes gleaming with the same energy that was emanating from the crystal. It would have been easier if you'd died at the warehouse, he told me. Then again, I haven't seen Earth summoning magic as strong as yours in a while. I'll be happy to take it off your hands before I turn you into a corpse. I spat in his face. He wiped it away, then drew his fist back and punched me. Megan shouted at him to stop, but he did it again and again. Each hit struck harder than it should have. The magic behind his strength grew the more the damn crystal pulsed. Blood spurted from my nose and dripped over my lips. Remus's hold on my throat slackened, but he didn't let me go. I'm going to take your magic and kill you, all while Megan there gets to watch. He moved to stand behind me, forcing me to stay on my knees. I struggled against his grip, his hold on my throat constricted, cutting off my air. Let him go, Megan gasped. Remus, please, just take my magic, then finish it already. Why would I do that when this is so much sweeter? Watching you lose what you love most in the world. You can die with the knowledge that his death is on your hands. I tried to say her name, tried to get her to look at me. When she finally did, I told her without words that none of this was her fault. I wanted to tell her I loved her one last time. But Remus raised his other hand toward the honing crystal. That amber fog came to me. Wherever it touched my skin, I felt it burning and stealing what energy was left within me. Black spots filled my vision. I was dying. Remus was going to kill me. And Megan was forced to watch it all. 
I told myself to fight back, to do something. The fog became denser. My eyes closed, and Megan's furious scream was the last thing to fill my ears before there was nothing but the slow beating of my heart. Chapter 13 Meg Cody's eyes rolled back into his head. This wasn't happening. It couldn't be happening. Remus's eyes lit up with the stolen energy he'd already begun to drain from my parents and me. Now he'd take Cody's. He was going to die right in front of me, all because I was weak. No, you're not weak. You were never weak. You know what's inside of you. Use it. Once Remus had activated the honing crystal, my body had been trapped in a tug of war between it and the power inside of me, fighting to break free. There'd been no chance to focus, no moment to even think of getting out of here. Cody's shoulders slumped. His breathing became rapid. I had to stop this. I had to save him. Then do it. Break the wall. Let your magic free. You are Vilisaris. The words played on repeat inside my head. I replaced my old mantra with this new one. I wasn't weak. I'd never been weak. I was a true Vilisaris. I was powerful. I am not weak, I whispered. Through aching joints and muscles that were almost too weak to hold me up, I made it to my hands and knees. I've never been weak. With a grunt, I got my back straightened, putting me on my knees. That fog was creeping back toward me now that I had Remus's attention once again. Oh, are you coming to play now, Megan? He asked with a laugh. Please, we both know it's useless. Give in. Relax. Enjoy the show. Your time will come soon enough. Ignoring him, I focused on getting one foot flat on the floor. I am a true Vilisaurus. At my words, my magic tightened into that familiar swirling vortex of light. Shouting through the agony searing along my scars, I pushed myself up, tugging against the chains that held me down. Not for long. I am powerful. And as for you, I muttered, glaring straight at Remus, you are going to burn. Embracing everything about my power and where it came from, accepting what had been inside of me all along, I let the last of my fear drift away into nothingness. My magic screams turned into a roar for battle and threw itself at the wall holding it back. An explosion of swirling energy shot out of my chest, bringing with it the full force of my magic. My back arched, and I spread my arms wide, snapping the chains. The force of it knocked Remus and Cody apart. Rolling my shoulders, I straightened, absorbing the sensations shooting through me. There was a wonderful heat like the first day of summer, followed by an icy touch, as if snowflakes danced along my skin. The touch of a veil being dragged across my body came next. My legs, which had been shaking, now stood firm, as if I was part of the very earth beneath me. A breeze carrying with it the sweetest hint of a forest blew around me. I turned my palms upward. The energy inside of me answered my call without hesitation. Five swirling orbs of light filled each hand. What are you doing? Remus shouted, getting to his feet. He turned to the four guards left in the room. Grab her! For the first time in my life, there was no panic and no fear. There was only the magic coursing through every fiber of my being. The four guards rushed me, and all I did was grin right back at them. Flicking my wrists, I unleashed the orbs. They twisted around each other right before creating a whirlwind of fire, ice, air, rock, and spirit energy around Cody and me. Remus continued to shout, but I didn't care about him. Cody! I ran to his side and rolled him onto his back, pressing my hands to his chest. 
I sent some of my energy into him, just as I'd done during the fight against the wraiths. From the way he shot up with his eyes wide, it might have been a little too much. Damn it, he rasped, clutching at his chest. Meg. In the reflection of his eyes, I saw mine glow with golden light. I wanted nothing more than to throw myself in his arms. But we had to finish this. I offered him my hand and yanked him to his feet. As awesome as I was at controlling my magic right then, I sensed this moment wasn't going to last. The honing crystal was still trying to drain me. And the use of so much power this fast wasn't helping. I'd been physically weak before coming here. Every second it took to end this fight was another second I felt exhaustion sneaking up on me. Cody and I turned toward the crystal. We need to break it, he told me. We raised our joined hands, our magic humming together. Just as we were about to bring them down, winds blowing with the force of a hurricane shattered the protective circles I created around us. We were blasted apart and sent tumbling head over heels across the room. I had no time to recover, then Remus was there, with a cyclone of air readying to pin me to the floor. And behind him, Cody held off the four summoners. Remus swung his left fist forward. A burst of air punched me in the gut. A second struck my face. I ducked out of the way of the third. Stones turned to dust where my head had been. Yelling, I sent a column of fire and ice straight for him. He hit the floor and rolled but the flames singed the bare skin on his right side. His yelp sent a thrill through me. My magic pulsed, needing to cause more pain. As he came after me again and again, we moved in a tight circle around the room. I sensed my control slipping. More and more, the power began to overpower my will to simply find a way to stop this madness. What it wanted seeped into my mind showing me how formidable I could be. I could bring this entire mansion down with a mere snap of my fingers if I wanted. You can kill him and the others, my power whispered. You can get revenge. End it. End it all. I raised my hands over my head and brought them down. A flurry of all five energies surrounded Remus. They lifted him off his feet, then slammed him into the floor. Bones cracked, and blood covered his face. I raised my hands, more than ready to do it again. Meg! Cody called to me from across the room. I glanced up, searching for him. He was there, through the wall of ice and fire and wind. The four summoners were trapped within tiny prisons of stone behind him. Outside, the fight raged on, and Remus was still breathing. All of this was his fault! How many talons had been hurt tonight? How many had been killed? I had to stop him for good. I had to make sure he could never come back. Clasping my hands together, I raised them once more. Megan, don't, Cody said. Don't let it control you. His brown eyes held my gaze. There was no fear looking back at me. Only the love he had for me. The love we had for each other and hope for what the future held. No, I whispered, and started to lower my hands. I can't. My magic rebelled, pushing me to take Remus's life as he'd been ready to take mine. But I wasn't a killer, and this power of mine wouldn't be used to harm anyone, not in this way. I sensed the backlash building, just as it had done three years ago. There were too many innocents around. Far too many. I couldn't let them die at my hands. I lowered my head, biting my lip against the surge of pain brought on by my magic and struggling against my control. I sensed a presence push through the barricades I'd erected around myself. Then two firm hands were on my shoulders. Cody, using his fingers, he counted to five, paused, then did it again. Too close. He was too close but I couldn't open my mouth to yell at him to move. Even if I did, he wouldn't listen. Not wanting him to get hurt, I focused on spirit energy and created a shield around him. He started to count aloud, the deep timbre of his voice pushing through the madness inside my soul. There were still too many people in harm's way. 
This wouldn't be like last time. I'd protect them. I'd keep them alive. Shutting my eyes, I sent out that spirit energy to surround every single being on the estate with a beating heart, friend and foe alike. My magic continued to fight against me. I pushed back, but there was no stopping it. An amber glow burned behind my eyelids. The crystal, that damn crystal was still here. It tugged on my magic, wanting to drain it all because of Remus. The moment my power became too intense to pull back inside of me, I turned toward the crystal, opened my eyes, and let it loose. Remus screamed in protest, but there was no stopping what happened next. The column of elemental energies struck the honing crystal. It shattered into a thousand pieces, sending a shockwave of magic in all directions. Cody tucked me against his body, holding me close while we were thrown clear from the dining hall and slammed into another wall. Vaguely, I felt my power finally concede and slip back inside my soul, waiting to be called on once again. The shields I'd placed around everyone broke. Cody's arms were still around me. His chest rose and fell. He was alive. We both were. Shouts echoed around the mansion. Footsteps charged toward us. I opened my eyes long enough to see Adam hovering over us. Then there was only the warmth of Cody's arms. Sometime later I woke up again, lying in a bed in a dimly lit room. In a bed beside me was Cody. He was sitting up and talking quietly with Adam and Nick. They were talking about Remus and his followers being taken into custody. The wounded were in the hospital too. Amazingly, no one died. At the mention of my parents being treated here, too, I scoffed. I'd almost forgotten about them. It wasn't as if they'd done anything back at the mansion. Meg? I looked at Cody and grinned. Hey. He was out of bed and sitting on the edge of mine in a shot. He kissed my forehead, and the Pierce brothers excused themselves. I tried to speak, but Cody shook his head. I scooted over, and he laid down beside me. Thank you. I whispered, already feeling myself drifting back to sleep. For what? Coming to save me? He held me close and kissed the top of my head. I always will, though you saved me. You saved everyone. Rest, Meg. I'll be right here when you wake up. I snuggled against his chest, lulled to sleep by the gentle, rhythmic tapping of his fingers against my arm. Walking was a struggle, but I couldn't stay in bed a minute longer. Late afternoon sunlight fell across the floor of what had been my room for the last week. When I'd woken up in the Summoner Hospital after the fight at the mansion, all I kept thinking was it had been one massive nightmare. But Cody had been there in the bed beside me. We'd survived, and so had the others. Everyone made it out, including Remus. It was a good thing I'd regained control of my power at the end. We'd needed him alive to get information about the rest of his followers. The last thing any of us wanted was any of them trying to come after Cody and me for the sake of revenge. He was in Talon custody and would remain there until death finally came to claim him. Cody had told me over and over how proud of me he was. I still couldn't believe what I'd done that day. I still had a long way to go with my power, but I felt there was an understanding slowly happening between what it was and what I hoped it could be. Time, Cody had reminded me. All I needed was time. He'd been released four days ago, his wounds hadn't been too severe, and his power had recovered quickly. I, unfortunately, took far longer to mend. On the bright side, I didn't have a new set of scars to match the first. Cody had been by every day to keep me company. The doctors had promised I'd be able to leave tomorrow morning. There was one thing I had to take care of before I did. And I had to do it alone. I eased down the corridor, nodding to those I passed. Most of the nurses and doctors I knew after being here this long. Steps kept time with mine. I didn't have to look over my shoulder to know I had at least two talons guarding my back. I turned the corner and found four more stationed outside a private suite. 
It was a room reserved for council members, and it was where my parents currently resided. I approached the set of double doors and paused. You can do this, I whispered under my breath. It's your life. You get to live it the way you want. Damn straight you do. I jumped at the voice, then laughed. Thanks for that, Briar, really. You are not who I expected to find here. Briar, with Zack by her side, shrugged. Eh, we were planning to come and visit. Then we saw you leave your room and figured we'd give the others a break for a bit. She looked at the door behind me. You can do this. And you're sure we're not putting you guys out by moving in with you? Zack shook his head. We've already got your room ready to go. Go do what you need to do. He checked his phone. Cody should be getting here in a little while, too. He was stopping by the home to see his mom. There's no need for him to rush that visit. He'd gotten a call this morning from Dr. Jillian asking him to stop by the home. I hope to meet Cody's mom soon. That all depended on how well she was doing. I hesitated another moment, until Briar took a firm hold of my shoulders and spun me around. We'll be out here waiting for you, she promised and gave me a gentle nudge forward. I tugged on the sleeves of Cody's sweater I'd put on over my yoga pants. I was wearing the dragon charm, too. He was doing what he needed to do, and it was well past the time I did the same. I pushed open the doors and entered my parents' room. Their beds were on the right side of the wide open space. Mom and Dad were sitting up, appearing in good health. Honestly, I wasn't even sure why they were still in the hospital. Their power had been drained by the crystal, but other than that, they'd suffered no injuries. I'd taken the brunt of Remus's anger. I made it to the middle of the room before either one noticed me. Then Mom's eyes narrowed, and Dad's lip twitched, a sure sign that he was pissed. How nice of our daughter to finally visit us, Mom snapped. Well, have you come to apologize? The scared little girl they'd made me out to be crept forward. Before she made it far, though, the familiar voices of my magic were there to remind me that I wasn't the powerless one. I wasn't the weak one. They were. They always had been. There was no reason to be afraid. Not of them. Not of anyone. Mom's angry scowl dissolved into one of confusion. Dad's followed. I started laughing and I hadn't even realized it. I laughed so hard. Tears came to my eyes. I swiped them away and managed to settle down enough that I'd be able to speak. You know, I've been in the same hospital as you this whole time, I told them. Just down the hall. Do you know who's been with me every day of that time? Not my parents. No, my parents couldn't be bothered to check on the well-being of their only child. The child who nearly died before she saved their lives. Along with everyone else's. Cody has been there. We don't want to hear about that man. Dad threw back the blankets and pushed himself up and out of his bed. After today, you don't have to. I looked him right in the eye and said loud and clear, Tomorrow morning, when they discharge me, I'm leaving with him. You won't ever have to see either of us again. Dad's jaw dropped, but it was Mom who let out a laugh and flippantly waved her hand at me, saying, Don't be ridiculous, Megan, as if we'd ever allow that. I'm not asking your permission, I shook my head. And you're really going to sit there and call me ridiculous? You have done nothing but control me my entire life. Control me and make me fear the power inside of me. We do what we do to keep you safe. To make me fear leaving you, I yelled back, and she blanched. You two might be cowards too terrified of your own magic to embrace it, but I never was. I saved us. I did. Not you. Cody and I got us out of that mess that never would have happened if you'd simply raised me like a daughter, instead of something you needed to hide away from the world as if I was dangerous. You are, Dad argued. You killed an entire warehouse full of people because of you. I couldn't believe they were still trying to argue with me as if I hadn't just used my magic, all of it, and come out on the other side stronger for it. You're the dangerous ones. You put a dampener on my magic. You attempted to keep it tucked away inside of me. If Taylor and the others hadn't tried to get me out that day, you would have driven me insane. 
Is that what you wanted? Really? Neither of you really cared about me, even after the incident at the warehouse with Remus and Raven. You blamed me as if it was my fault for being born. I stood taller. I'm finished. Done. I have my own life to live, and that's what I'm going to do. Don't bother trying to contact me. I turned to go, and Mom hurried to get out of her bed. She rushed towards me, her hands outstretched, but they never reached my arms. My magic reacted with barely a thought. The spirit shield pushed her back. How dare you use your summoning against your mother? Dad ranted and tried to grab me next. This time the spirit energy forced him all the way back to the foot of his bed. Don't, I warned, and started for the door again. At the threshold I paused. By the way, I informed the masters of everything you two have ever done to me. Everything. They would like to speak with you both. Megan, get back here, Dad ordered. Megan! I pushed the door open, and four summoners entered. These weren't talons, however. They were the personal guards of the masters. Lucy and William Vilsars, the masters have gathered, and they would like a word with you, the woman in the front stated. Take them. Mom protested while Dad yelled at them to let him go. I exited the room, no longer willing to waste energy on dealing with them. It was far past the time they faced consequences for their actions. I wasn't sure what the masters would do. At this point, I had too much good going on in my life to worry. Their yells followed me out into the hall. But Briar and Zack were there to distract me. They guided me straight back to my room and shut the door. You are amazing, Briar said and hugged me. Ready to go home in the morning? More than ready. I picked up my phone. A message from Cody was waiting for me. I'm so damn proud of you, Meg. I'll see you in a little while. I texted him back, then settled on the bed and listened to Briar and Zack talk about the Morris estate. Their stories dissolved into bantering, and soon the three of us were cackling away. Nyala and Jack came by not too long after, and my room was filled with more laughter and happy conversation. This was all I'd wanted for so long. Friends. A family. Once Cody made it here, I'd finally have everything I wanted. Inside my soul, my magic hummed, content at last. Chapter 14 Cody I tucked my cell phone in my pocket after checking the text from Megan. She'd finally stood up to her parents. I wish I could have been there with her, but she told me I had somewhere else I needed to be. Dr. Jillian had phoned early this morning, saying that I needed to stop by and see Mom. I'd been nervous, but she'd promised it was good news. I stood outside the main doors, wondering what I was going to find on the other side. I entered the home, checked in at the front desk, and one of the nurses directed me to the day room. Not my mom's room? I asked. The nurse beamed up at me. Nope, the day room. It was hard not to run through the home. Excitement bubbled inside me even while I told myself not to get my hopes up. When I reached the hall that led to the day room... Laughter I hadn't heard in years spilled out the doors. Stumbling to a stop, I leaned against the wall and listened. Mom. That was Mom laughing. She was talking. Moving as if I was in a dream, I entered the day room. Dr. Jillian sat in one of the comfy armchairs that faced the glass doors leading out to the garden. Sitting beside her, fully alert, with a smile on her face, was Mom. She turned to face me. Cody? Mom? I tried to keep walking, but my feet were frozen. She got up out of her chair. Then she was hugging me, and I couldn't stop the tears that fell from my eyes. It's okay, she whispered through her own tears. It's okay. I'm so sorry for everything, Cody. I don't understand. I leaned back and stared into her eyes. How? Time, Dr. Jillian answered for her. All she needed was time. And you gave her that, Cody. Is this, I mean, are you going to be okay now? I asked. Mom shrugged with a sad smile. I hope so. Dr. Jillian said I might still have some episodes, but they'll be few and far between. She cupped my face and sighed. Gods, you look so much like your father now. You're so grown up. 
I have so much to tell you. I want to hear all of it. She wiped the last tears from my cheeks, grinning up at me. She held my hand, and I could even sense her magic. It was only a whisper, but it was there. I especially want to hear about this Meg of yours. Dr. Jillian was giving me the highlights. You'll love her, I said with a laugh. She's everything to me. She's home. Mom and Dr. Jillian exchanged a knowing look. That settles it. Details. All the details while we eat lunch. I stayed with them until evening came around, and Mom was too tired to stay awake. I gave her a massive bear hug after I walked her to her room. Hearing her laugh once more was more than I could have ever asked for. I'll see you in a few days, I promised. She patted my cheek. You have a life to live with, Meg. You'll see me when you can. Though I would like to meet her soon. She'd love to meet you, too. We said our goodbyes, and she went into her room and closed the door. Dr. Jillian waited for me at the end of the hall, and I joined her there. She reminded me that though this was great progress, to keep in mind that Mom would still have her bad days, she said she'd keep me updated as usual and gave me a hug too and sent me on my way. During the whole drive to the hospital, I couldn't stop picturing what the future was going to be for me now. Mom was finally recovering and returning to herself. Then there was Meg and the love they'd grown between us. After everything that went down at the Gorgothus mansion, we'd only become closer. The control I'd worried I'd lost that day, seeing her tormented, had morphed into something else. She had become my strength, just as she told me the other day that I was hers. I was more than ready to see where my path with her was going to take us. By the time I reached her room, a question was burning in my mind that I couldn't shake. It was too soon, that's what I kept telling myself, but it wouldn't go away. Megan, though, was not alone. Her room was filled with all our friends, with our family. Cody! I opened my arms in time to catch Meg. I lifted her off her feet and hugged her close. Are you supposed to be running around like a maniac? I'm being discharged tomorrow. I think I'll be okay. I set her on her feet but didn't let her go. I couldn't until I'd kissed her properly. It had been too damn long. Ignoring the ruckus made by the others, I took my time. Megan melted into me. Too bad it wasn't tomorrow morning, and we could leave the hospital now. Finally, we parted, and I led her back to her bed so she could relax. How's your mom? Megan asked. She's coherent, I said, and that started another round of excited exclamations. And she's looking forward to meeting you soon. Me too. Megan pulled me over and patted the space beside her on the bed. The conversation they'd all been having before I arrived picked up again. At some point, it shifted to talking about my mom and how she was doing. That turned into my telling stories about my time growing up with the Talons. Zach had his own to tell, too. And soon, it was nearing midnight. The nurses came in to tell the others they had to go home for the night, before we kept the entire wing of the hospital up. They let me stay as they'd done every night Megan had been there. I'm really glad to hear about your mom, she said, while she rested her head on my shoulder. Her voice was thick with sleep, and her eyes had slipped closed already. It's pretty amazing. I kissed the top of her head. What I'd been wanting to say to her all night was right there on the tip of my tongue. Meg? Hmm? I glanced down at her and chuckled. Never mind. Get some sleep. I pulled her into my arms and shut my eyes. The right time for that conversation would come soon enough. Stop cheating, Zack said through his laughter. Get out of my head. I'm not in your head, Briar argued. Yeah, you are. I can feel you poking around in there. The Morris Mansion was filled once again. It was our usual weekly game night. Zack, Briar, Nihala, Jack, Chase... All three Pierce brothers, and even Hunter and Trish, were present. There was food scattered around the kitchen, and the table was taken up by the murder mystery game we'd elected to play tonight. Living at the Morris estate for the last three months had been great for Meg and me. She'd had a chance to have a place to be safe, surrounded by those who cared for her, while she figured out what she wanted to do with her life now. A few days after she'd been out of the hospital, we'd heard from the masters that her parents had been placed under house arrest. 
and would remain so indefinitely. I wasn't sure how she would take the news. Aside from taking a few minutes to herself, she'd been all right. Eventually, I had a feeling she'd try to reach out to them. But that was months more down the road, maybe even years. When she did, she wouldn't be alone. Her parents were never going to threaten her again, not while I was alive and breathing. After that day, we'd sat down and had a serious conversation about what she wanted to do now that she truly had freedom from her parents. She told me she wanted to use her summoning for good and thought about joining me in what I did with the Talons. It'd also give her a chance to be trained in all the elements. Even better, over these last few months, neither of us had worried about her magic. Megan was still learning and would need training, but there was never that fear in her eyes that she'd lose control again. She'd even began to meet my mom, who was steadily improving. Dr. Jillian told me just the other day that in another six months or so, mom might be able to leave the home for good. That had brought me back around to the question I'd been wanting to ask Megan for some time now. There just hadn't been a good chance to do it. While Zach and Briar continued to banter, Megan had got up from the table and slipped out the back door. I went to follow. She stood on the patio, staring up at a sky full of stars. I wrapped my arms around her waist and pulled her into me. She tilted her head back. Hey, she said, grinning up at me. Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I just wanted some air. It's great being around everyone, but sometimes it's still a little much. That was another thing that had changed for Megan and me, I supposed. Her panic attacks were rare these days, and I rarely had flashbacks anymore about the attack on my parents. We were truly healing. You seem very thoughtful right now, she mused, still looking up at me. Something on your mind? Just the same thing that's been on my mind since you were released from the hospital. What's that? I reached into my back pocket and pulled out the piece of paper I'd been carrying around for the last month. Zach had helped me find the place. It was already mine, but I hadn't shown it to Megan yet, not wanting her to think I was putting any pressure on her to move out of the Morris mansion if she wasn't ready. I held out the paper to Megan and held my breath while she took it and looked it over. This is a cottage, she whispered. It is. It's a cottage that's really close to Talon HQ. She glanced from the paper to me. It's already got a decent garden in place, but I'd figured we'd expand it eventually. It's surrounded by a forest on all sides that has a creek running through it. Megan's lips curled into a smile. We'd expand it? Cody, is this... Did you... Did you buy us a house? I rubbed the back of my neck. The ground beneath my feet rumbled. I might have done that, yeah. I mean, I've been saving up for years. I just never had a reason to do it until now. So, what do you think? I can move us in while you're training at HQ. And the commute isn't bad at all. But if you don't like it, we don't have to. She threw herself at me, kissing me and cutting off my rambling. You are incredible. Do you know that? I'm going to assume you like it then. She kissed me again. I love it. You bought us a house. That's insane. She hugged me and I squeezed her back, silently promising to always watch her back and stand by her side. We were in this life together, from here until forever. She leaned back and looked at the paper again. Can we see it tomorrow? If that's what you want, yeah. How long have you been sitting on this? I shrugged. A while. Oi. You two coming back inside, or are you going to keep making out on the patio? Jack yelled through the open back door. Leave them alone, Nyala's voice followed. He finally showed her the house. Ah, oh, shit, forgot about that, Jack said and beamed at us. Never mind. Carry on. We're coming back, Megan told them. She stood on her toes and kissed me, lingering with her lips on mine. We took a moment to stare into each other's eyes. Then, hand in hand, we returned to our makeshift family. Tomorrow, a new adventure awaited us, and I couldn't wait to see what it would be. The End This has been Vengeance, Another Generation, Academy of Ancients, Book 11, 
Written by Avery Cross. Narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Copyright 2023 by Avery Cross. Production copyright by Avery Cross.